We're going to cover some topics. We're going to cover history of genetics. We're going to talk about organic biology and, and how, it, how it impacts cannabis. We're going to talk about appellations. And we can weave all this together into a, into a big web. But at any point in time, man, just make sure you stop somebody and, and get access to a mic if you want us to stop and cover a topic or go into something or anything like that. Because that's the whole point of it is that it's, it's really trying to share the information that we've gathered over these years so that as a group, as a, as a cultivation culture, we can actually do better together. So with that in mind, I will introduce Mowgli and Jeff and Justin, and I'm gonna let them just give a quick little, little blast on themselves because otherwise I won't cover them correctly. So Mowgli. Yeah, I'm the CEO of, of Phylos. We're a cannabis genomics company based out of Portland, Oregon. We're working on sequencing the DNA of all the cannabis in the world and figuring out what the hell we're actually smoking at any given time, which is still to this day a mystery to a lot of us. We have testing tools that are just meant to help growers and we're working on helping people do really advanced plant breeding to bring this plant into the future, make it work better for growers, make it less susceptible to powdery mildew and flower earlier and all those things that every other crop has been through all this science and they've been incredibly advanced by it and cannabis hasn't had access to that. And our whole, our whole work really, you're going to hear about a lot of things that intersect with this on this panel, is to, is to bring all that science without fucking everything up in the way that that science typically fucks everything up. You know, so there's all this diversity, there's all this subtlety, there's all this stuff that's not science. There's all this stuff that has to do with flavor and feeling and history and culture. And it's like, so how, how do we, you know, and there, there's a world of people out there in Canada, mainly, who just want the biggest <laughs> plant that yields the most oil that they get the most single cannabinoids out of. But that's, you know, and that will happen, right? But so how do we do all this science that can drive that and, and turn it in a different direction so we're actually bringing out the full richness of the plant. That, so that's our challenge. Uh, I'm Kevin Jodry, uh, founder of Wonderland Nursery. Uh, I usually say career hustler, because that seems how I got here. But uh, it's basically a lifetime of being involved in cannabis. I was a young guy on the East Coast. I was involved in what we call then criminal cannabis, and I got to see an un unbelievable amount of cannabis as a young guy coming into the country through my neighborhood. And it, it, it absolutely uh, changed my life in terms of I was just fascinated. And over the course of the last, you know, 40 years, that's been really the chase is to, is to better understand cannabis. And over the last couple of years, i say the last 11, it was involved in legitimate industry, um, regulated industry. And to trying to figure out how do you maintain those cultural connections and how do you keep the quality present? And at the same time, how do you really share the information with other people so that you leave a legacy of people who follow you? And so my, my direction has been that. And it's, it's been a, a very interesting ride, to say the least. Uh, my name is Jeff Lowenfels. And in 1975, I was in Alaska. And the Supreme Court decided that you could do anything you wanted in the privacy of your home, including smoking cannabis. And so as an assistant attorney general, I helped write the opinion as to where you have a right to privacy uh, so that you could smoke cannabis in your tent or in your hotel room. Uh, we couldn't quite get a phone booth. That wasn't, didn't work. The <laughs> cars didn't work. Anyway, but uh, so, so I've been fooling around with cannabis since 1975 and before. Um, and... Uh, Somewhere along the line, I started to write a book on uh, organics and resulted in teaming with microbes. And then one day I decided I, I needed to figure out how plants eat and that resulted in teaming with nutrients. And then one day I decided that not enough people knew about mycorrhizal fungi and how, how it was so effective in growing things. And so I wrote a third book. So I have three books, um, whereas I used to have two and I was America's dirtiest lawyer. I now have three books which makes me lord of the roots, sorry. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in organics. I'm very interested in making sure uh, that when the big guys come in, the little guys don't get pushed out. Um, and I am very, very interested in making sure that we never again let the government prohibit cannabis. So. Yeah. 
<clears throat> My name is Justin Calvino. Um, I, every time I, I'm with Kevin, I, I realize, like, in 94, I started selling cannabis on uh, Thayer Street. <laughs> I grew up, so I, in Providence. So I grew up, like, three blocks off of Thayer Street in Rhode Island. So we're, like, Rhode Island cannabis. I probably sold, I sold it to Brown Campus. So it was, like, Brown and RISD. And I uh, worked at a skate shop and, and um, moved out to California in 96, uh, where, you know, I was, you know, buying cannabis from Arcata from up on the square or Boulder Creek in Santa Cruz and selling it on Haight-Ashbury. And, um, you know, I spent two years as a homeless teenager on the Haight and uh, kind of trying to go pro at this thing. And, um, and I, you know, so I have some history in it. Uh, I, you know, moved out to Mendocino County. I... Um, you know, did what everyone else did. We hid behind our locked gates. We were trying to raise a family, small farms, work on, you know, local systems of governance, you know, sharing, community fire departments, you, you, you name it, and um, got arrested and ended up uh, in cannabis policy and ended up saying, you know, enough is enough. Let's, you know, Sherry Glazer said, get out of the cannabis closet. So um, came out and uh, drew a map. And I drew an Appalachians map. I took my design talents and, and uh, you know, and my knowing of uh, regional, you know, specific strains and heritage, and I, was, you know, put it down on paper. And started. I was going up to Wonderland Nursery and asking Kevin, oh, "What do you think about this? What do you think about that?" And, and uh, going to all the breeders and you know all the regions, and you know, we we put together quite a, a project. And um, since then, I've done things like the Emerald Exchange, trying to get small batch cannabis farmers um, access to market. So started bringing farmers out of the hills, setting up tables for them, getting them in mason jars, you know, helping them brand and market themselves fully illegally. Um, you know, so everybody's like, what are, we, what are we doing this for? And I'm like, because this is this shit's coming. And, um, you know, so we've been working hard for the small guys, um, you know, for quite a few years now. And uh, I'm really I'm just, and, uh, you know, it's an honor to, you know, sit here with Kev and, um, Mowgli, I'm really interested in to learn more about what it is that you're doing and how you can help solidify some of the some of the metabolomic research and data collection that we're doing to internationally recognize Appalachians of origin. Um, and Jeff, you know, I, I'm a I'm a lover of roots, man. Ten years in regenerative design theory and, and permaculture practice, and so you know that's that that's that's my geek. So I, this is going to be fun. Right on. I think we're going to get into uh, we go right into the history of, of genetics where of where we began. And so that way we can start the process because it really ties into all the stuff we're doing where mm -hmm. the varietals that came into the United States initially, what people call land race, I don't use that verbiage because land race to me is open pollination and, and not selected. And so when you start to select cultivars that you're going to work with, you also choose males from those open populations that you're going to use to pollinate with. And as soon as you put your hand in the, in the pile... That's a cultivated variety meat. It's no longer land race. Land race is basically plants that have, are developed for survival. That's all, that's all they're for. They don't, they don't care about yield. They're not worrying about quality of smoke. It, it's a genomic form that wants to live. And once humans started to, from these, from these genetic piles, they pulled things out that they liked. They started to pull things they liked for whatever reason they chose. And when you take a look at the world in terms of latitude, you can see stuff that was equatorial was chosen primarily for cerebral nature. We can make generalizations, but the more we go up in latitude, the more we start to see CBD genetics come out. As you start to look through these, this material on lab analysis, you can start to see these connections where the individuals that lived in you know, latitudes 20 to 40 had a much harder life than those from zero to 20 in terms of uh, climactic situations, abundance of food, and just in general living conditions. And so, so much of the cannabis that comes into the U.S. from when I was a kid was coming in off of ships uh, on the East Coast primarily. And so it was coming over from Mexico into California. We used to call that stuff Sensi. That would have been like late 70s. But so much of the weed coming into New England was coming in through fishing boats. And so just like in Humboldt County when, when cannabis uh, took off in Humboldt, it wasn't the hippies that really blew it up. It was the loggers. Because the logging industry disappears, all of a sudden you have this massive industrial workforce that has no job, and they say, you know what, we're going to get into growing weed, the hippies are making money, we might as well make money too. And so the next thing you know, Humboldt County is punching out as much cannabis as one could grow, but it was not the hippies that were punching it out, it was the industrial loggers. New England was the same thing, the fishing industry collapses, uh, lobstermen collapse, my whole neighborhood's a, a fishing, fishing area. 
and all of a sudden the uh, the fishermen are grabbing all the, the weed from the offshore boat. So the boats are coming in out to sea, the fishing boats would go in, grab the weed, bring it into the neighborhood. My family wasn't into cannabis, but my, my family was into organized crime. And because they were into organized crime, uh, they were they were kind of terrifying people. It allowed me to access the cannabis industry in a different way where I could kind of do what I wanted and hang out with who I chose because my family had such a uh, reputation. And so it allowed me to get involved with some stuff as a young guy that wasn't normal. So I got to see this incredible diversity of cannabis and it would come through seasonally. We would see, we would see varietals coming in and the people that were bringing it in in bulk would tell you, hey, we got Colombian coming in. And then we knew Thai would come in basically when school started. So the end of August, 1st of September, you'd see Thai coming in. You'd see Afghani come in through the season. You'd see cannabis move globally into the East Coast. You would see hash move into the East Coast. But it was always on a really consistent basis. But what we noticed was that it wasn't homogenized, that, that all of these varietals were very distinct. <laughs> And that's, I think, where we, we went wrong with what we did in genetics, where illegalities forced us to make changes in terms of how we perceive cannabis. And because there was a shortage of cannabis in general, meaning that the, the open population couldn't access it freely, whatever you could buy, you would buy. And what occurred was, I, I, I call it a dumbing down of the population. And we started to really truncate what was shortened, what was available, and what we used and, and how we went about it. And that's where, like right now, it's fascinating to have you know, Mowgli on stage because what he's doing, he's going back in and taking a look at these varieties on a, on, a, on a genetic level saying, hey, in the genome itself, what do we see? Where do these things come from? What traits do they have? How do we start to pull the directions apart and start to take this homogenized mix and start to re-separate it out? Because fundamentally, all the cannabis that came in from these overseas situations was, Justin's working on Appalachians, but Appalachians are just designations of production zones. But all cannabis came from designated production zones. That's what made it unique. And like Jeff is, is, is uh, cause I've read his books, and, and I enjoy the shit out of them. Um, but it, it, it's about how cannabis was produced then organically. And so the relationship between cannabis in terms of genomic, how it was produced, where it was produced, all contributes to what we have today. And I think so much of this, this direction that we're trying to go is to figure out how do we go back into this pile, separate the pile, and figure out how do we put what belongs where, where, and how do you drive the greatest input out of it? And I think that when you get into organic methodologies versus chemical methodologies, a lot of it is a, a, a function of, for one, uh, I don't want to call it ethics, but desire. And also simplicity, because uh, chemical systems are, the, are favored because it allows you to do a lot of automation. But, and so I don't try to knock salt, guys, but it's not what creates these hyper-complex varietals. The relationship between what's in the soil, the microbiology, and the indigenous microbes from the regions combined with the unique soil profiles all create that. And I think that for us, so many of us, as we start to go forward as smaller operators, craft operators, niche operators, Appalachian operators, organic operators, genomic hunters, you're, that's the direction we start to go. Because otherwise what it is is it's homogenized cannabis. And as Moog said, you're talking about uh, operations in Canada that are doing heavily funded, huge operations for extraction, put anything together. And the problem with that is that none of us can compete with that on an economic level. So it, it fundamentally wipes us out as operators. And the direction is to, is, to, is to differentiate yourself from that package, but it's a process and it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult process because it revolves many of us to work together in a collaborative fashion. And I think the cannabis didn't require that same collaboration. We were all in a collusion. We would all work together to make the money. We would all work together to keep our mouth shut. We were pretty good about it. But we didn't have to work together in the same combined level because we made enough money. None of us really were broke if you were in the weed game. If you were, you weren't growing very well. And, and that's true. You shouldn't have been broke. It doesn't mean that you were a king or a queen. It just meant that you had adequate income. And for the first time, the, the money is what's driving this unity. And as you start to have the unity come together, it starts to become cultural, spiritual, where you start to realize, hey, wait a second. What we liked was that, that relationship that worked. 
And I think that that's what's taking place now is as we start getting into this, this situation of what it is that we're creating, why are we creating it, and how do we utilize this, this, the skill sets and the tools. And so we, you know, we go back into this time period where all this beautiful cannabis came into the United States in the 70s. We would say, well, you know, back to land movement, 68. But back to land movement in Humboldt was in 68. But there was also these other uh, situations, where they call it, Chautauqua. You know, this, this resurgence, re-love for the land, um, spiritual awakening, renaissance. But you see it all over the, the New England area. You saw it in Tennessee, Kentucky. You have it in pockets of the Midwest, Colorado, Idaho. You have it on the whole Pacific Northwest. So it wasn't just isolated to one region. It was all over the place. And all of these places received this incredible genomic packages. They got material from these countries that was pretty true breeding in the sense that you could basically see what was going to come out of it. You would have mixed packages in terms of resistance because that's really what broad spectrum cannabis is but you would have a somewhat of a consistency and people started to take those varietals and then they would start to mix them with other things to work for their situation. So you started to see some of the first really good crosses coming out of that time. And to me, that late 70s, early 80s is really the zenith of American cannabis where you had people who were able to work it fully heavily and they were using organic biology and they were using sun-grown methodologies. And so what it did is it allowed you to use basically the material that was from these other countries in the same form that it was grown there. So you weren't having to make a radical change in how we fed it or how we selected it. And then you get into 83, which was really the beginning of the drug war in full form. And I always tell people I remember 83 because I got dragged out of high school in handcuffs for cultivation and that that was a, a turning point for most individuals because at that time, all of a sudden, the enforcement became heavy. Cannabis was driven indoor. And that's when you started to see these changes in what was required and what was needed. And you also started to see changes in what individuals wanted to consume because prior to that time period, we would call it cannabis more ethereal, meaning more, more uh, uplifting, more spiritual, what individuals want to call sativa, even though it's all sativa. But... Um, mental, ethereal, uplifting strains. The, the world started to change. You started to see a desire for different cannabis, and as the advent of indoor cannabis came along, you needed to have things that flowered on a quicker time frame. You needed stuff that was stockier. People started choosing things that worked in those capacities, and you started to see a lot of these old varieties get tr trimmed away. So the first real culling of the population was in that early 80s, where a lot of the old beautiful land race, or derived from land race, taken through cultivated variety, brought over to here, held in form, pollinated, worked outside, they all got culled out because that stuff didn't work on the indoor methodology. So all of a sudden, boom, we get into indoor methodologies. That's when you started seeing uh, the, the, sh the shorter, broader leaves, stockier, more narcotic cannabis become more in vogue. And it's just basically run that, that, that direction ever since. And I think that, you know, what, what I'm involved with right now is trying to go backwards in time and find things from those golden eras of cannabis when the varieties had um, a more diverse effect and you had a much different amount of things to play with. And I think that for so many individuals right now, they're so used to homogenized cannabis where if you take a look at it genomically, you see that there's these clusters, but so much of the cannabis on the shelf today is really related. So basically it's, you know, you have 40 cousins you're messing with. So you might as well be in Kentucky. <laughs> And, and there's a problem with that is that it really, it really doesn't allow individuals to have the full range of experience. And what it does, it doesn't allow you as cultivators to have a, a diversity in your own libraries. And it doesn't allow you to have differentiation. So when everybody's growing the same OG, it doesn't make a difference. It's all OG. So you might have the best OG, but it's still OG. Then where's the differentiation? And that, on that point of it is you know, how do we utilize these tools that we have forward? Where how do we take knowledge on organic methodologies which allow plants to express themselves in a more balanced form? How do you utilize the locations of Appalachians, which means specific production regions, and optimize that? And then, you know, how do you get into genomic mapping? And where where is the future of that? And so I'll throw it to Moog for a second and say, hey, um, what, was the, what was the reason why you started mapping cannabis and what was it that you saw initially and then where are we going with it in that direction? Thanks, Kev. Welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, so when we started mapping it, we were trying to tell this, this historical story that you, in a way, just told 
off the top of your head because you knew it. But we're trying to go back a lot further, too. So we wanted to know where all the varieties came from. I mean, the story begins... Like, it, you know, it doesn't begin when the stuff shows up here, right? Like, it begins in, like, 10,000 years ago in Central Asia. And then the plant followed humans everywhere around the globe. It, 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 it literally went everywhere. And, and we're starting, we hope we're starting to be able to piece together the story of how it migrated. You know, we think it came over to South America with the conquistadors. And, you know, somehow it came up to the United States, and there were all these introductions from China, and there's this whole long history of it. But throughout that time, these, these individual varieties were preserved. And, and at that, like we call those land races because they, so I mean, the way that plant evolution happens once humans starts to, starts to mess with it, right, is like humans get their hands on it. And then they, they're not breeding, but they do, this, they do seed saving, right? So for millennia, humans are saving seeds. And, and they're growing this diverse population in this defined geographical region, and they're saving the seeds they like. And, and that exerts a little bit of, it's not, it's not real breeding, but it exerts some selection pressure on it. And you end up with these, what they call land races, that it, you know, it, in a certain valley in somewhere in Afghanistan or Thailand, for maybe millennia, people have been saving seeds, and the plant has evolved along with the humans, and it, it's it's a bit different from the wild variety, but it's also not a cultivated variety. And we don't know if people started making crosses before that stuff started getting imported to the United States. We, we just don't know. Like, it, it may be that in the 50s, um, in Thailand, they were making crosses, and it was really a cultivated variety. Or if it was just a land race, and it was still growing semi-wild, and they were just saving seeds, we, we just have no idea. Can we find out? Yeah, we, we could find out. If we, if we got enough samples from a region, mm -hmm. um, we can do a thing called molecular clock analysis and figure out how fast it was evolving and see if there's a signature of human selection pressure on it. We don't have enough samples from each area yet to do that, but we could, we could find out. But then the, the thing is, like, all that stuff comes here, just like you're saying, it comes here, and bam, it's just all mixed together. And so all those genes are still in the gene pool. They're all out there. They're all circulating. And when, when we look genetically at the map of all the cannabis out there, it still seems incredibly diverse. I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of kinds. But there's a sameness to it because, like, like imagine you put, like, a bunch of different things in a pot, right, and they're all different, and you just stir it and stir it. Like, all that stuff is in there, but there is a kind of homogeneity to it. The, the great thing about genetics is that um, some genes, when you mix them together, they blend, right? So like if a tall person and a short person have a kid, that kid is often of intermediate height. Th those genes are, there's a lot of genes that go into height and together you, you end up with something in the middle. But then there are lots of genes like blue eyes and brown eyes, they don't blend. They're just discrete characters. So they, they stay, they keep their force. And you can stir the pot as long as you want. But in every generation that gene is just like boom. But it, it's randomly distributed now. And so in cannabis, we see the same thing. Like, there are certain features that I think get blended. Um, but there are other features that uh, they just pop out like they're still there. So the, the stuff, you know, before the introduction of all the Afghani stuff, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, the reason why everything became so sedating uh, like, that was not a consumer-driven trend, right? I mean, those plants, we had to, people just had to grow those plants. And so suddenly consumers are like, oh, I like this, but that's what there was. Kind of, kind of, because it was, it was so powerful at the time. It was such a radically different experience to smoke these nasty. We, at the time, the first Afghanis I met were messing with, what they call Mazaris. And they were the dark golf balls with the red hair. They just make you sweat. And you weren't really used to like something that shook the shit out of you when you smoked it. Like you'd get lifted and, and forget what your name was from, from ethereal cannabis and you'd be like, wow, the 
colors of the sky are incredible. But when you were smoking really devastating Afghani, man, you wanted to go home and lay down and go hide in the bed, and you'd wake up and your mom would be wiping your forehead with a rag saying, are you sick? And you'd be like, no, I'm just like, really you're fucking you're high. Like, yes, I'm really I'm high. And, but, you know, right. it, but it evolved into where people wanted narcotics, where I've got, we, we were talking one time about maybe uh, 11, 12 years ago, we talked about trends. And someone said, uh, oh, geez, a, a fad. And I said, no, it's not. And because I, I, I look at I look at trends and fads with cannabis and that's and I said, no, it's not. And I but I didn't understand why. So I did a random sample of a thousand people because I had a dispensary that um, I was able to use as my my test period. So I could ask questions and I started logging the answers and the answers on a lot of the heavy myrcene based, uh, carophylline based stuff was um, heavy sedative because the, the tremendous number of people had o opiate issues. And so what we started to see over time was opiate driven. Um, replacement, where if you were on opiates, you could utilize things that were based in specific terpene categories as a replacement, but other varieties wouldn't work as well. So I think at first when, the, when those Afghanis came out, they worked well for indoor and they worked well for a, a shorter cycle, but I think also it was such a radical change in the type of high that you received that I think that it really turned people on where they were like, wow, this is some really, really powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a combination of, of all those drivers. But those other traits, right? Those traits that, um, that, that originated with the plants that people tend to call sativa, even though I'm not going to call it that. Um, like, those are in there, right? They're still circulating in the population. Some aspect, as far as we can tell, some aspects of those traits are blended, right? They've hit some kind of, like, you know, they're just being averaged out with the Afghani stuff, which is too bad. But some of them, they just pop out sometimes, right? There are varieties that just have those aspects, but they, I think they don't have all of them, right? So, so there's all these different genes that need to be recombined to recreate those varieties. And we can do that now. We can go back, we can turn the clock backwards if we're really paying attention to what genes we want to put together. It's just really hard, complicated work. And so right now we have this soup. But the small farmers in California and Oregon have to differentiate themselves. And th the way they're going to do it is they're going to take that, they're going to start to take that soup apart, and they're really going to start to re-differentiate the plant. They're going to start using real breeding to really drive towards very specific things. You know, right now breeders drive towards a flavor. You know, that, that's, that's a overarching goal, you know, and, the, and they'll get certain effects and, but they're, they're still just stirring the pot. Once people start to identify real goals and they can really differentiate cannabis into back towards specific kinds that we originally had or towards, towards kinds that are new, new combinations where you're really combining a whole handful of traits to make a plant that is outrageous in some way and that if you mixed it into the whole pool, like it would all go away. That's the differentiation that's going to make local growers in different appellations start to stand out. And people in different regions, they're going to focus on different things like that. And we can get there where it's like, wow, in southern Mendo, you know, they're making plants that, are, you know, that remind us of what Panama Red used to be like. And it, but it's going to take a lot of work. It's not this, the way we've been breeding now, it's not going to get us there, I don't think. No, I don't think so either. I think, I think too that like with what Justin's doing with the Appalachian, and I'm gonna let Justin and Jeff kind of chew this one up a little bit because really, the impact on the overall is based off of the plant and its inputs, and so much is the direction of where it's located, and then what what's what's feeding it, what's driving it, and you're seeing this huge, uh, I say, a renaissance in organics, and I think cannabis drove the renaissance in organics. I think that f for most individuals they started to become very aware that they were feeding their plants better than they were feeding themselves. And because they had the disposable income, they could actually start to uh, create a market at stores where they would say, hey, I want to go buy these products, and stores started to cater to them. And if you go to places like where I'm from in Humboldt, there's a lot of organic shops. And so, you know, and, and it's disproportionate for the population how much organic selection that you have. But I think so much of it wasn't that the people were so aware, it was they became aware from the fact that they were taking better care of their plants 
It started to make them realize that the products that they were purchasing were of uh, lower quality from supermarkets, and all of a sudden there was a demand to feed this opportunity. And you're starting to see this uh, incredible desire to hunt out microbes, um, the, uh, the in, in, in indigenous microorganisms, where people are starting to do their own mining. And I got involved in that maybe, I say, I say 10, 12 years ago, where I saw these Filipino guys that had been culturing stuff for like 100 years, like sourdough, and they were passing it on. And so I started to mine my own microbes and then tried to do the same thing. But it was, I didn't have the skills to hold it in that form. I, I'm, I was learning. And then with fermentations. And, and how that applies to your appellations, because these appellations have a unique input, the terroir, like Frenchie. Have you seen him, Frenchie Cannoli? <laughs> Frenchie's, he almost spits the word out, terroir. And, but the point is that I'm gonna let, if possible, let Jeff and Justin kind of get into what is an appellation and, and, and from his definition of it, because it applies to us in cannabis, and it's been used in so many different words. And then, and then hopefully, then, then uh, Jeff can kick in about, you know, what, what these inputs are and how they affect, because overall, all of that applies ultimately to the end quality of the product. And for me, more than just the end quality of the product, also the sustainability of the whole model, because to me, I think that, like I said, I try not to go off on salt-driven systems, but it's, to me, it's not sustainable because you're, you're, you're creating too much waste. You're creating waste in the creation of it, and you're, and you're doing damage on the usage of it. And so I'll turn it over. That's a lot. <laughs> I wish I had a pen and paper because I, I had something on all of it. Um, one thing is, for a shout-out to Frenchie, is uh, all of this is about proving Tewa, right? So it's like we have a 20, 50, 100-year project ahead of us. This, what we're talking about is hypothetical and theoretical, and, and everything that we're doing is community-driven research. You know, all of us together putting our, putting our knowledge in the pot and coming up with what the best system is. I think that uh, prohibition didn't do us a service um, with plant counts. I think that's something we're getting into right now with the Appalachians, you know, project. Is you know, we're talking to a lot of cultivators up in like Palo Verde and places like that, and we're talking about you know, you know, standard set to indigenize inoculants, engineer all soil on site, and you know, and then we're getting farmers saying, well, you know, what about our yields? You know, we can't go in ground. You know, there's no way we're gonna smart pots, raised beds, engineered soils. You know, this is part of our new culture. And really, that's part of a prohibition culture. That was when we had to maximize the amount of, of yield we were getting off of a per plant basis. Because the federal government was saying, you know, 99 plus plants, you know, above 99 or 100 and above is a federal crime. So it was like, so everyone was like, oh yeah, 99 and below, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll you know, state kind of frowns upon us. But uh, so, you know, so people were like, how do we get the biggest freaking plant? And how do we do that? We, we put 800 gallons of soil, we engineer it all, we pump it full of juice, gas, whatever, we're, you know, and then we get a, you know, a, a 5, a 10, a 15. Someone in Southern Oregon had a 22-pound plant, you know. Um, variety. Do I? What variety? I, I think it was a cookie, but I, it, was on the, it was on a magazine. It was in a big magazine. It was like the 22-pounder. And I was like, look at it, I was like, that's got to be crap. Um, but, you know. And so we were having this conversation the other day on a, on a sub, actually I think it was this morning on a subcommittee call with Appalachians, and um, we were talking about, you know, in the fields of Afghanistan, where, you know, in some of these cannabis heritage regions where you see these, you know, um, you know valleys full of dry farmed, in Afghanistan, dry farmed, waist high cannabis, right? That is, it looks the opposite, there's all this like Afghan because the opposite of these, you know, 10, 12 pound monsters that you see in the magazines now with all of us growers sitting there with our like, you know, shirts saying, yo, we did this. And it's like, but what are you really doing, right? You know, what are you doing to the plant? What are you doing to the genotype? What are you doing, to, you know, what is that phenotype? We're, we're hunting something that's gonna get bigger, higher yield, but our quality markers aren't set properly. So we talk about money, I was getting on the money thing, and we're all like unifying around money. And the fact of the matter is, is it's like now, we're going to be getting into this place where genetics are going to be bred, where you're going to have this like homogenized crop going out into the open to grow 500 acres of cannabis. And it's our responsibility now to say, how is that cannabis grown? 
where was it grown? In soil? What was the marine layer condition? What was the altitude? What was, you know, what, what did we do to in, not only indigenize the inoculants, but to actually co-evolve that cultivar to the soil and to the, to the climactic conditions over decades? And how is it going to express itself fully in that region? So we are looking at, you know, f now profile testing. Terpenes, you know, terpene profiles. Like what's going to, what's, now everybody's talking about like, you know, what's the terp count? You know, so it's like the cannabinoids are, are, you know, every day there's another cannabinoid, you know, a compound that's coming out in, in reaction to another terpene, and now everyone's seeking that medicine, right? Well, that medicine is actually regionally specific, right? The different heritage strains, you know, we call heritage, let's say 50 years, selected to breed that quality, that trichome development. So it's like Appalachian's development right now is going to be talking about quality medicine development. You know, and we're going to be seeking strains and we're going to be seeking cultivars from these regions because they were able to express themselves fully in that region and have full profile developments. And that's done, I do believe, in the mineral content of the soil with that, with that marine layer condition, with, the, with, with that altitude. Um, and we see it, I mean, it's, you know, in Spire Rock, um, I watched some of the, the, the world's best sour diesel being grown. I would never, for the love of me, grow that sour diesel in Navarro. Like, it, it, it's like shitty. And it's, I watch my friends and neighbors do it every year and throw away half their crop because it's market driven. They want something that's like high potency. They want something that's, so we need to like, you know, we need to start having this, qual you know, this co conversation about quality and these quality markers. And I think that the, what you're doing, Mowgli, is really important because that, you know, that cellular capture, that data capture, you know, to tell us, like, okay, that's a marker. That's what that plant expressed itself in that way. That's the genotype that we're seeking for that region, and then we need to, mu we need to match that with the region and use that as IP protections and go ahead and claim it. So that's, that's, that's kind of where we're going in the Appalachian space with that. But I think the conversation needs to be about unifying around markers of quality, like, you know, indoor, mixed light, Appalachian, you know, terpene, cannabinoid, like what are, what are, you know, like what are we looking for to come out of the strain so that the consumer market can start to differentiate, you know, the, the actual product that we're consuming? Well, a couple of things first. Um, it seems to me that we, we need to recognize what, why we're here and why we're really talking about this stuff. And I think if I say Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Scott's Miracle Grow, you know, you get the idea. What's going to happen is this Canadian situation. You're going to have a big company, a Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola. They're going to want one kind of cannabis because that's what they want in their standardized drink. Maybe they'll have three different drinks, but they won't have very many more than that. And, and uh, you know, if we're not careful, then we're going to be forced to grow for them. What we want to do is grow for individuals. We want to stay in business without having to merge with a gigantic company. We don't necessarily even want to merge with each other. We want to continue to do our thing individually uh, and, and share our information and make sure that we're not cut out of this business by the industry that is clearly forming. No question about it. Number two, we want to make sure that we don't continue to allow the government to fuck us over as we do this. And I mean this in a couple of different ways. Why we allow in Alaska, you know, they, they say, you don't have to test your stuff for pesticides. That's bullshit. Of course you should. We're selling a product that people are ingesting. You know, whether you're organic or not, people need to know what's on their product. You know, and so you, we got to make sure that the government does what we want them to do, not what these new regulators want to do so that they can keep their jobs. And those two things, I think, are the backdrop that you got to keep in mind when you ask the question, which I think we're all trying to ask, which is, I put it in this way, can you grow Durban poison in Anchorage, Alaska? I want to grow Durban poison in Anchorage, Alaska. Can I really do it? And to me, based upon the books that I've written uh, and the stuff that I've you know, read from your company and others, there are three, stool, three legs to the stool. The first is genetics. And if you don't have the Durban poison genetics, 
you're not going to have Durban poison. So we have to figure out what the Durban poison genetics really are. The second are, is the soil. You know, that's, that's in theory my expertise. There is no question that the soil has a direct impact on all of the things that go on inside the plant for the various reasons that are in all three of my books, but not the least of which is that you've got bacteria and fungi that are responsible for feeding the plant. Now, they in turn are impacted by microarthropods, nematodes, and protozoa, but all of those things together are what help make up your appellation. Um, and and if, you, if you got the Durban poison genes, then what you want to try to do is make sure that you've got soil that mimics the Durban soil. So you need to figure out, and I'm sure we're going to end up in a situation where in addition to doing, you know, the, the genotypes and figuring out, I mean, you know, figuring out what, what, what the DNA is, we're going to have books that are going to be able to say, and this is what the soil is like. This is what the microbiology is like. This is what the, this is what the, uh, you know, the, the biomass of the soil is like in that area. If you talk to Dr. Elaine Ingham, she will tell you you need slightly more fungal than bacterial. She will tell you, you know, that you need certain kinds of protozoa over other protozoa. And all of this stuff is important, and we're not getting it. You, you should be getting it, and I think you're beginning to pick up a little bit of it, but we need to make sure that we're all sharing this information and figuring out what it really is. We don't know yet. And then the third leg, from my perspective, is light, sunlight. And, and uh, uh, Sin, Sin, are you here? Yeah. Okay, uh, if we can just for two seconds, maybe while Sin sets this up. So you've, if you don't have the sunlight from South Africa, you can't really grow the Durban poison. Now we concentrate on soil, because that's what the grape growers do, you know. But in cannabis, it's the light, that, as much as anything, that causes the soil microbes to act the way they act, and of course the plant to act the way it acts. So, so we've got a situation where we used to grow outdoors, and we had sunlight. And then the prohibition came and they pushed us indoors. And so we've got a lot of people who are still going indoors, and the industry seems to be coming to the conclusion, you know, that, that if they grow indoors using sunlight as well, that they're going to, you know, they're going to be benefit. I don't know where the little grower fits in in that scenario, but we've got to learn the differences between the lights that Scott's miracle Grow wants you to buy you know, because they bought the company and okay, they're going to push it and they're going to advertise it and they don't give a shit if it doesn't do a couple of the things that you really need it to do because they bought the company and they need to be making money. Or we can, we can develop our own product, projects, which is what this fellow over here has done. Now, you may never have heard of a plasma light, but what Sin is about to show you is the sun in a little teeny light that he can pick up with one hand and he can change the gas that's inside this lamp, and he can change that gas in many different ways to create the sun that you want. So we went to NASA to talk to him about the potential of growing food using this light. So if you want to grow South African cannabis in Anchorage, Alaska, you set the light to the wavelengths, which are all available, by the way, so that you can duplicate the same kind of light that's in South Africa. Well, it's pretty amazing. Now, none of this stuff makes any sense unless you know what the genetics are. And, and so it always starts with the genetics, which is why, you know, the Phylos Bioscience Project is really so key. But I think you would agree that the genetics are influenced by sunlight. Yeah. Environmental conditions matter. Genetics Absolutely. matter, but epigenetics matter, like, just as much, and maybe even more. Do they? Do, I mean, I know they matter, but do they matter as much or more? No, I they do, where basically the expression is latent in all of these watered-down strains that we have and that we see, but when you give them the right environmental conditions for them to express the best version of themselves, you see a different version of that genetic, the period, and the story, yeah. whether it's, you know, the same cuts check, from check, check. the same moms, right. the same cuts from the same moms, you take them nationwide, right. the, the uh, expression of those is going to be based on their environment, not just the ingetics. 
or the genetics. That's right. But the question is Epigenetics the, but the question is, is if, saying. And I agree with you. I think you're absolutely correct. But but if you are able to control with better precision the other the other a actions Th then you then you have less of an influence by the epigenetic stuff, but which is not necessarily bad, by the way. But we Jeff, that organic like well, I, I agree. I understand. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Say you go down to to Humboldt, you get a lot of soil mm -hmm. from one of the valleys there, and you bring it up to Alaska. Right. And you and you plant you plant a, an OG in it, and then you turn on the plasma light and you dial it in so that it has the same light at the latitude and longitude where you took that soil. Should that plant then be eligible for the Humboldt Appalachian? That's that's the question I was going to ask because I think it's a very no, good no. question. I no. Mean, well, I mean, that's a <laughs> no. No. And, I, and, I, and I think that's an interesting no, question. No, and because, inter it's, it, because it's, 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 it's millions of years of coevolution of that soil's relationship to the entire environment, not just the sun. But you haven't, so but you haven't been the, growing the, the cannabis for millions of years. At, well, here's the deal. It's not about the cannabis. It's about protecting the earth, right? We're also, this IP protects the earth that's in different. which we stand. Right. This isn't just about we are using cannabis genetics to find out this metabolomic capture. But once we capture and, and use a sensational nature that we have this stage that we have right now, we can protect genetics worldwide, but not just the genetics, the humans that live in co in, in coevolution with those genetics. Indigenous tribes all over the world need these protections as well do their cultivars. And so if we start manipulating that and start shifting that. And then it's not just shifting the genetics, it's shifting the policies that those genetics protect. And we start shifting the policies, policies that protect the people, I mean, capitalism won. So I, I, would, I would agree that the wait, biggest... Wait wait, 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 before you answer, let me just answer your question in a slightly different way. I, if you take Alaskan soil, because this is I've done, if you take Alaskan soil down to Hawaii, you can grow a giant cabbage. The giant cabbages that we grow in Alaska is soil-based. I live in Anchorage. You can't grow those giant cabbages in Anchorage. Wasilla, where they grow them, Palmer, is 40 minutes away. The difference is the soil. If you bring that soil from Wasilla into Anchorage, you can grow the giant cabbage. But you can't grow the giant cabbage without that soil. So it's in a way... The, it's, it's, it's the same genetics. The same conditions. It's not the same expression. That's why we need that capture. Yeah. Um, that's why we need that capture. We, I was involved in LED development probably a decade ago with a, a company where Helio Spectra came in and said we want to do LED development. And at that time, none of the Europeans could touch cannabis. So they used my facility to do all the R&D, and then they would ship all these light scientists in from all over the world to do the tests. And I would run... Uh, standardized testing where we would hold one under what we knew. So I knew the cultivar. I would put it under the traditional HPS. We would then run the heliospectras. And we couldn't get the stuff to, to shine the way we wanted to until I took them up the hill and we started to measure the sun coming off of my farm. And that started to let them get a better baseline of what was desired for that situation. But from what you're saying is, yeah, the soil microbes from that and, and, and if we move it, does it, does it create an, a, a, a sameness but I think that Justin's right in terms of the overall picture is too big to capture. So you can't capture an appellation by just microbials or just sunlight because it has to be the entire environment. And even though we don't have cannabis appellation, so to speak, because none of us have 60 years minimum of, of, of genetic manipulation where we've got genomic forms that have been developed for at least 60 year period, which is typically like a standard in appellations. We don't have that. But the point is that we always had that theory of if you wanted to grow good Colombian, because I knew that the Hawaiian, the same thing, was when I was in Hawaii and I was consuming some of this killer high mountain Hawaiian, which is really Southeast Asian varietals, it was so nasty, but when we grew it in Humboldt, even if we had the ability to protect it for the longer season, it didn't have the same uh, flavonoid profiles and the high was different. And so we knew that it was soil biology that was driving it, but we didn't have the ability to replicate it. We weren't, we weren't knowledgeable enough at the time. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and, and 
all of these things make yeah, a difference. Grab, grab the mic. But the question, the question is, I live in Anchorage, Alaska, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go down. You know, right now I can't go down to California to buy my Durban poison from you. Yep. So I got to grow in Anchorage, Alaska. Yep. Now, if we end up with a wrong kind of regulatory system, i.e., they're going to let states make a determination. In some states, you'll be able to do it, and some you won't. So that 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 presents the sort of the problem that a wine industry doesn't have. You know, you can ship anywhere. Yeah, but is it responsible? Now, that's a whole other question. That's, that's, the, that's the question we have to ask as consumers, as, you know, it's like, is it responsible to put that, 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 that weight on the earth because we want something? Is it, are you saying? Is as, 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 and if we need something, is it better for us to go where that something is already? For Appalachians in, in, in NorCal, you're going to see the incredibly diminished amounts of cannabis that can be grown based off of watershed availability. So they're going to, they're, they've already controlled the water flow pretty good, but over the next couple of years, they're going to go at all these watersheds heavily and start to determine, and it's kind of arbitrary because no one really knows consumptive how much water is there actually in the ground to suck up. But they're going to start to change how much you can actually cultivate in your watershed. So how much cannabis can be created, which is terrifying for a lot of the smaller people, but they don't understand that it's scarcity creates value, just like scarcity creates a value of an antiquity. Sand is pretty old, but it's not valuable. Um, you get something that has a scarcity, there's a value. And I think that as we if go you forward... Can ship it. If, if you can ship yeah, 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 You can ship it as you go forward. But first, even within these limited markets... For the individuals that pre are able to produce certain batch lots that are less, it'll be clearly defined from, I mean, I'm looking at operations right now that are talking about doing 200,000 pounds a year. So, I mean, I'm talking, I'm talking to guys that are putting in that OPSA that are looking at, you know, that's an that's, that's, that's incredible amount. 200,000 pounds off of, off of a single operation is frightening. So you, you And it doesn't sound like scarcity. <laughs> no. And and so the thing is that with the Appalachian situations that he's talking about, it's not just geographical zones, but it will be it'll be compressed because the state is gonna compress it through water usage. And so you're gonna see um, a lot less produced in general, and in these specific regions, once we are able to use genomics and understand microbiology to a degree that lets us tailor what we're really trying to do. I think then you'll have a differentiation. You don't really have it now. I think right now what you have is a basket of cannabis. Everybody's just grabbing it. You don't really have this upper shelf and this lower shelf. It's all kind of this what it is. If everybody's growing the same weed all over the state, and we're all saying we're doing some unbelievable job with it, how can you really compare that? You can't. It has to be these unique forms. And so, you know, this, this, this situation, and look at this, I'm sure there's people here that are doing larger operations, and it's not meant to exclude them at all, because those larger operations, they'll use the same information, because they're going to use microbiology to increase resistance, and they're going to use genetic modeling, sifting, marking, and selection to be able to improve what they do. And then the Appalachian regions are where they produce these things. If they're within those regions and they follow suit or they have an investment in one of these, it'll, it'll diversify their portfolio. So no matter what size you are, the conversation still really applies. I think it's hilarious mm -hmm. that in Humboldt County, they're talking about water rationing. And in, 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 in Siskiyou County, they're building tunnels to ship water to the desert. Mm -hmm. And they're stealing water. So it's like... So if you want to grow a bunch of cannabis, move to the desert. I mean, that's like, like makes absolutely no sense. That's but political. Humble, but, yeah. humble, but Humboldt County, the, your water guys are going around to farms and to producer to to large scale industrial facilities, uh, soil guys, and getting them to double their water count so they can keep the water in Humboldt. Mm -hmm. Because there's people already shopping for your water to ship it out. Well, we got a we got a water mill. I mean, this this isn't about cannabis, but it kind of is. Is that there's a there's a lake called Ruth Lake, and it was it was designed to feed a, a mill. So this giant mill facility asked me if I wanted to put a, a, a major nursery operation in. But when I toured the whole facility, it was a super fun site. And I just knew, I said, I, there's no way you can get this thing clean enough to really do any work. And it, it's just not the right location for agriculture. But the thing that made it attractive was that they have a couple million gallons a day of water flowing from the dam into this facility that's just flowing out to the ocean. 
And if they can't find a user for the facility, they're going to have to sell the water to someone else versus just re-divert it back into the river. Yep. So fundamentally, you know, when it comes to these appellations and it comes to water usage, it's, it's political. Because when you're, when, you're, when you're putting in, you know, unbelievable operations in the high desert, high desert's defined by less than 10 inches of rain a year. So if you're going to call it high desert, then that's really what it means. So, you know, we, got, we, we, should, be, we should be popping around 70 to 80 inches up in Humboldt, mm -hmm. which is a phenomenal amount of water. But they're going to limit us tremendously. I'm on a very protected watershed, but the watershed emanates from my property. So it gives me a chance to work. And what I'll do is I'll work a canopy size that lets me get to a level that's allowable. Because really, you can't, you can't beat them right off the bat. And that's why it's, it's important for a lot of the smaller operators to say, listen, if I only have 10,000 square foot at best, 5,000 square foot, then how do you work in conjunction with other operators in your watersheds, in your directions, to find out you know, what kind of, kind of bio biology systems do you utilize? And it, like what Moley was saying, which he's been saying for a while, is you guys got to get together and team up and work on these projects together so that you have the resources to be able to actually function because it's expensive. And with the cost of, of cannabis uh, production right now, which is unbelievable for the smaller operator to actually function on, this, this teamwork is essential. And so as we go forward, man, it's, 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 it's imperative that a lot of this stuff gets brought out. But the conversation of can you grow Durban in Alaska, we, we, had, we had the similar ideas of can you repeat the experience of the cannabis? Because what I knew was from me traveling all over the world and smoking weed from all these places, no matter how much we grew back at home, it wasn't the same product. And we knew that the light was different, but I didn't understand that light just wasn't energy, light was information. Once I started to really mess with the light scientist, I started to find out that it's information. And if we change the spectra, we can make a plant flower under full 24 hour lighting. We can make a plant not flower. We can make it elongate, we can change its shape, we can change its profile, we can change soil uptake, we can change what micro microbial counts and how they function. And so much of that is, is just knowledge that we're learning. And I think the problem is that what we use is we use lab metrics to determine quality. And so that's one of the issues is that you're using total terps, total potency, this cannabinoid, that cannabinoid. And the, the fact is that it's all in a, in, a, in a synthesis. And when you start to say if it isn't above 22% THC, it's not top shelf, it instantly knocks out all these varieties that are seven and eights. And when I was talking to a Colombian, that's a Colombian collector out of Colombia, so he's able to collect all the South American varieties. So he and I have to use Google Translate to talk, but for real. But the point is that he's a collector, he's an older guy in Colombia who collects in Colombia, and what he was saying is, hey, the only reason why you guys aren't getting the effect you want off of these varieties is because you're, you're muddied with the, <laughs> the Afghani cannabis that you're smoking. He said it basically muddied you up and you need to cleanse your system. And then you'll get back to being able to experience the effects you want off these 7 and 8% strains. And, and I always look at the total terps as irrelevant because it's what terpenes are present, not the total concentration of them. That's why I don't like stuff, I, I always jam on terpenator because I call it homogenator. It makes everything taste the goddamn same. So yeah, I'm glad it has hot numbers, but it, it's, it's homogenized cannabis. And, and a lot of this is trying to get the, the market to understand it. And I just got jammed by someone on, on plants that I submitted to a competition of why did I submit this plant? And I said, because I want the competitors to be able to sell the product. And if I give them something like some Laos that I'm messing around with right now or some, of some, some fr from Laos or from Nepal, for one, it's going to have lower numbers, and it's not going to move on the shelf because of it. Wait, 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 wait. You're saying the lower, you know, the lower numbers, this industry in particular mm -hmm. has never said these words to people. And whenever I say it to them, they go, gee, you're right. Low number, just take another hit, for God's sakes. I mean, but, you know, I mean. But they see it as an economic concern, though. Like, I, for someone who owns dispensaries, someone who actually owns stores... Right. For a long time, it is, you have to gently educate them and say, listen, just because it says this number doesn't mean you're going to get to smoke less. Because it doesn't really, it isn't true. The, the numbers don't dictate the reality, but they dictate an economic reality, just like terpene numbers do. And so I had a friend that had a 5.6% you know, terps, and I, and I showed him a 2.2 <clears throat> terp strain, but, and the 2.2 was volatile. We oh, oh, we did. We did. We did it to ourselves, but the problem is we have to undo it. Because what we've done is we created a situation where the diversity is almost impossible to put out if it isn't at these at, 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 at tremendous levels of, of numerics. 
And I'm somebody who breeds things to go into heavy numerics where I chase these upper 30s. I, I put them in because it's marketability. And I tell people why I'm doing it, and it's not my entire project. It's just that when you want to make money in modern cannabis, and you need to or you're going to go broke, that shit better have hot numbers. And it doesn't mean it's better, and it doesn't mean that it's going to get you higher, and it doesn't mean it's going to be a better experience. But the market is obsessed with it, and even the ranking systems coming in through some of these farmer federations are trying to quantify the same thing, that a top shelf five star is you know, uh, over 22. And the reality is, I think that we really have to have an educational system come into play so that the, the users start to understand that the metrics are something you look at after the fact, not first. You look at the numbers after and say, hey, that's interesting, this is the unique terpene profile that made this happen perhaps and these are these interesting cannabinoids that I'm experiencing and it starts to allow you to see patterns and those patterns let you find other varietals that are similar so that you have a better range of choices because in these limited production models you won't be able to get it dispersed throughout the whole state See, this, this stuff should have gone Sorry, man. No, I was just going to ask you specifically, do you still mess with the 78, the six cut? Yeah, yeah, I still mess. Like, I, I have. Like the, five, five years ago, yeah. that was like, we were like talking about like, you, they had to like recalibrate the machine for that. The highest like, CBD you know, dominant overall like cannabinoid six, strain ever found. It was like, yeah, but it was like 16963 and it was like, mm -hmm. and it was an OG. Yeah. And I mean, it, it was great. And it, it, I mean, like I made great hash out of it. Frenchie made great hash out of it. We all smoked it. We all enjoyed it. We had a very cerebral experience. Kept on going back for more. Mm -hmm. Like that was our like little strain. I, and I, it was like my it was like my favorite thing. And then, you know, like the Madrone picked it up, and those guys have been running with it. So it's like there is a market for it, and oh, the, there, for, there, the, for, for the for that for that full profile. There, what's, there the is. what's the ratio on that? It was sixteen nine six sixteen nine six three was mine. It was sixteen nine on the on the CBD and a six three on the THC. And it was an OG. It was a seventy eight. And it was a number six. It was, I think it was a six or the, eight. The, cut. the six, the eight pheno. And then I have a ten pheno that uh, the, the the ten cut that comes out at around nineteen eight and then like uh, ten two. Yeah. And so it, when we did that, it, I think it had a combined cannabinoid of maybe like thirty three point five, which at the time had never been seen in a CBD dominant cultivar. Yeah. But these are outliers, yeah. and because see the thing is, I got lucky in that when, when labs <coughs> came out, I was one of the first people that was playing around with them. So I got access to labs quick, and I understood how to use the tool to let me see inside so I could steer directions. And those directions are where we drove CBD in America. So it was the, the sh my crew in Arcata went through the Canatonics, and then, and then Ringo went through Ringo's line. But that was, that was the basis of all CBD material you have in America today, came out of those projects. But I wasn't caught up with that. For me, with the CBD work, once I found cultivars and had a variety of them that had certain ratios, what I did is I just put them into the market. I was, I was more driven into what I would call you know, recreational cannabis. And, and so I used my, my predicative work to steer directions in that so I could get these jammed numbers because what it did was it let us move, let us move product. Yeah. And then it let me put cuttings into hands of farmers that could then make money moving those pieces. And part of it was to explain to the public at the same time, these are numbers that you use to sell, but this is an 11% that you want to enjoy. Yep. And so we would give the education, but man, you got to sell the weed in order to stay in business. So let me make the suggestion next time, because <coughs> I, I have a dispensary in, in Oregon that does this. Mm -hmm. So most of the weed in Oregon has now gotten really cheap. This stuff he sells for 25 bucks a gram. Yeah. Okay. It's got low numbers. Yeah, yeah. It's killer weed, but it's got low numbers. Mm -hmm. Instead of putting the numbers down, it's the price people look at. Mm -hmm. And so he's charging 25 bucks a gram for something that by numbers, people might pay six for. Oh, oh yeah, no. It's and just he can't keep it on the shelf. The numbers are right on the product, though, it. now. Like, the, the numbers are what you can't see. Oregon's different than California, where Oregon still allows you to smell the weed. Oregon, Oregon still lets you open the jar. See, this, this California. Is I mean. This is what I mean by we can't let the government in California yeah. say you're not allowed to do that anymore. Come on, what are you talking about? This is our industry, not your industry. Let us do what we want to do. You know, I mean, it's not going to kill anybody if you... Yeah, anyway, sorry. Well, there, it, that, that's, that's to, I think to me that's fundamentally uh, tax base, where it's, it's not so much they're afraid you're going to smell it, but they're afraid that a little nugget might fall out of that open container into someone's hand for free. And so, you know, when we saw this happen, and when we, we, we used to do a lot of giveaways, I was involved in a tremendous amount of, of uh, free CBD, where I've never sold any CBD, and I've been in, 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 in the industry f forever. But I've been in, 
you know, dispensary operations now for probably almost 11 years. And for the 11 years, I've, I've never sold any CBD material. If you, if you came to me for CBD material, you got it for free. And, you know, it was probably about 120,000 free clones that went through on books, and another 30,000 that we kicked on the side. So maybe, you know, 150,000 clones I kicked out for free. And then probably another ungodly amount of, of tinctures, RSO, and all these other components because there was a, there was a greater good that was involved. And we knew that that was going to come to an end, and that's why we kind of went at it so hard, because we knew at some point in time there's no way anybody was going to allow us to do this much charity. We just knew it was coming. And so that's the problem is that, you know, we, you want to fight the government on this crap, but you fun, fun, fundamentally you need to have the finances to survive long enough to do it. And they've done such a good job by limiting what one can do and how one does it that I think so many people right now are just financially crippled and it's really stopping any kind of battle to where you, you have to work with these realities. And I think part of the reality is have varietals that you can use as, as attractions and then create the, the awareness of what is an experience of cannabis. How do we quantify it? Does one just want to get affected? Does one want a quality of effect? And it's the new individuals that are coming in that you'll be able to start to give this this information to because they don't have a back history. The, the thing is, those, those, in, those individuals aren't coming in in the way they should be because of this feedback loop between the money and the high numbers, right? Like, everybody's a little bit caught in this trap that is a side effect of prohibition. Everyone's making moonshine, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're just, yeah. and moonshine yeah. is an artifact of prohibition. Yeah. You know, you, you want that <coughs> high potency stuff for storage and transport because shit is illegal. And when prohibition goes away, an industry is supposed to evolve into variety. They're supposed to evolve, they're supposed to start making Pinot Grigio that civilians can appreciate. But we have this existing market base that will pay for stuff. And there's all this financial pressure and there's gluts on the market and everybody just wants to it's just this very short-term thinking, like, I got to hit 30 so I can move stuff, because otherwise I'm going to die. And we're, and we're still, it's like we're acting like we're still in prohibition. No one's willing to take the leap to make plants that smell outrageous, and they're incredibly low numbers. And you can bring them and you can smoke them at, at Thanksgiving with your whole family and all the old people. And it's, and like, there's just thousands of people that aren't coming into shops and I know dispensary owners who, who want to start bringing in those people, but they can't because they're like, I'm not going to carry that stuff on my shelf because it doesn't move. And it doesn't move because they won't carry it on their shelves and they won't market it. And so everyone's in this financial jam selling to these, like, you know, 200,000 consumers who smoke all the cannabis and only want numbers in the 30s. And it's like we're on this wheel. It's like we have to take a second and get off the wheel and look at the fact that everybody would like to smoke some pot. The flower we just have to make it for them. The flower market could learn a lot from the low-dose ed edible market right now. Yeah. The edibles I mean, the, have figured this out the, way the, the before. edibles mm -hmm. figured it out. I can't tell you how many, like, you know, 45 to 60-year-old, you, know, uh, you know, women or, you know, or, or, or gentlemen are, you know, 2.5 or 3 milligram five, dose, three, three yeah. dose they and you love know, it and they love it they're having and it, fun and it wasn't, we didn't get down to 2.5 to like last like year last year it took it till last it like, year for anyone to get under Kiva, five and and, and also like one chocolate and people yeah. were like and it's so funny because you look at these like ladies at like concerts and stuff like that with their little kiva tins mm -hmm. and they pull out the little kiva tin and they take like one little bean and they're like would you like one and i'm like they're microdosing. Yeah, they're microdosing. They're microdosing. They're mi you know what they'd really like to do? They'd like to take out a little pre-roll that's like yeah. 4% and just be like... <sighs> well, so I smoke 12 to 14. To I smoke yeah. 12 to 14. And I, and, and, and I, you know, and so like in founding the exchange and many other markets, I've always grown, I, I, I worked with Equilibrium, growing um, African-based uh, sativas. Mm -hmm. That's what I smoke. And pineapple, because I'm, a from, I'm from a pineapple region, right? So it's like, I like smoking in the pines. A good in the pines is between, like, around 14%. So if I smoke a, if I smoke that pine in the pines, you know, or at least Derek's cut, I smoke that, I'm having a great time. I want to do my taxes. If I smoke the <laughs> Afghani, I want to run from my taxes. I'm like, fuck. You know, it's like yeah. hiding up in my mom's bed with, like, sweating and all that. You know, so I, I don't, I don't want to do that. But so the idea that there is that, that market is emerging, but when I smoke at, like, an exchange... And somebody comes to me for a higher dose, 
you know, and I smoke a pineapple or I smoke a, you know, a Malawi or something, they feel like almost they're having a psychedelic, they're actually having fun. They enjoy you know, They're it enjoying mm-hmm. themselves on cannabis. They're like, this is great. What did you put in this? But that's exposure. Like, See, yeah. I, I use yeah. my girl as the, as the, I call her like my weed guinea pig for, for what I call the lower octane strains yeah. because everything that I was smoking was too, too strong for her. And so I went through a couple of years of sifting period where I was able to get into some of Mean Jeans lines and I yep. was able to pull out this beautiful cherry back cross and I, I <coughs> bred into it and pulled out maybe, you know, something that comes around around like 12 too. Mm-hmm. But it's beautiful and it's got a really rich quality and the flavor's right. And for people who smoke it, it's, it's unbelievably satisfying. But I'm telling you, put that stuff on the shelf and you, it sits there because of the numbers. There, there, there has to be some system that, that comes where you start to have the ability to get people to come in and actually experience cannabis and then see the numbers afterwards. Yeah, it's just called marketing and We call it cannabis light. Yeah, we just don't have the, but the <laughs> thing is you're competing, you're, you're competing, the marketing part's hard because you're having to compete with people that are, that are, have the ability. Like the Emerald Exchange and events like you used to do, oh, oh, no worries, brother, was that it allowed you to have people come and actually be present. And it lets you now have cultivators. That's where the, the problem with all the cultivation where the farmers can't sell direct, the farmers can't have tastings. Uh, you know, they, they, you can do it illicitly, but the problem is that's not going to allow you any kind of real penetration. And if you had that, then what you could do is you could have a real diversity in your lines where you had a true gradient. And the gradients can be based off of potency gradients and also how you feel from the varietal, and that's based off of terpene relationships. And so you'd be able to have true gradients that matched what you wanted to release from your farm, and it would have things that would satisfy people who wanted more broad-based stuff up to, uh, you know, to peel, the, peel the top of your head if you, or if you skull. And some people like that too. So I don't, I don't throw rocks at anybody what they like. Some people like, uh, you know, THC isolate, where they, they want that stuff at you know ninety nine percent, and that's what they like. No, let's, let's make that also. <coughs> yeah, yeah, no, it all has to, it, no, it fully, it, it all has to be there. It's just that traditionally, that's that's been the problem. So that's why someone asked me. They said, why did you chase such high THC varieties for so long and and develop males to throw those numbers on other plants? I said because it sold. And it allowed individuals to be able to have sellable varieties which kept them in business. And so now we have to redo. Just like back in the day, I used to go hunt varietals that had low scent signatures. And people say, why would you do that? I said, because I'm, I'm somebody who was here before charcoal. So before charcoal technology came out, you'd have a full pair of balls to grow dope illegally. Or otherwise, you were about to have a heart attack when you pulled into your driveway and the whole neighborhood reeked. And you were looking at catching a felony case and going to prison. And Garbage so I would, cans. yeah, I would Garbage hunt. I would hunt varietals that had low scent, and it allowed us to cultivate and move. And so, I mean, by the time I'm done with this, we end up snuffing out a huge portion of the population. But that was a function of illegality also. That Most is of, so upsetting. And I know. Say, it's, I'm it's, sorry. It's, it's, oh, no. Yeah, you don't you think I, I'm digging it? It, it? I had my own library of stuff I would keep because I was somebody that was basically a lunatic, so I could handle the risk. I, I was pretty ballsy, but for the clients that I built operations for... That wasn't the case for all of them. And so for these people that wanted to cultivate cannabis in you know, the early 90s, when you know, the indoor was really taken off, it had to be, and, and charcoal wasn't present, and, and I was using uh, high-tech ozone at the time to where I could blow the ducts of a, of a building clean. But regular people didn't have access to this stuff, and so it was really a function of what could you cultivate and grow, and then we would have things that were higher level. And so all of this stuff that, we, that gets us here is all a result of prohibition. And that's why, for me, I'm trying to go back in time and mine the things that we've lost. Most of the libraries that we held for so much of us have got taken in raids. So between raids and armed robberies, we've lost a tremendous amount of genealogical material. Yeah. And, but that was just that's how it was. We, you know, I mean, I could lament the, the, the story, but it's just it is what it, what it is. And it's trying to you know, move forward from here. And that's why I give people the background on it and I explain to them, look, this is why I chase the numbers, but this is why I'm trying to expose you to an 11% varietal. Yeah. My, you, my you, position you lets me do, do it. it. You, I had you, to do it. You had to do it. But, but listen, like, everybody's fighting for their lives now, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't think people are taking this seriously. The, the, massive, the massive farms and the companies that are just... They're just after oil. They're just after THC. They're just cannabinoid production companies, right? <coughs> so if, if we stay in this market where we're, we're chasing numbers in the 30s for THC and we're making oil in the 90s, it's like 
I'm going to have a little farm and I'm going to compete with big ag who's growing fields of THC. We can't compete in the THC market. The THC market, the high THC market is now kind of gone. Mm -hmm. if, if we're going to have Appalachians, if we're going to have small farms that survive, a ton of THC is just not where they're going to compete. They, they have to find other niches. And it's not just because I want to smoke that stuff and because it'll bring in other customers who are interested. It's just that that, that thing that was prohibited, prohibited in prohibition, big companies are taking that now, and that should not be our job anymore. So, so the question is, how do we get there? I mean, and I can see a couple of different ways. I mean, one, the work that you're doing, you know, there's, I, don't know, I don't know how it, how it shows up on a strain so when I, when I go and buy a Durban poison, then I know that's really Durban poison because you said the DNAs were, you know, what's, is there a stamp that's going to be developed? Yeah, there's a stamp. So and listen, if I was in Alaska and I wanted to grow Durban poison, right. I would go to Humboldt or I would go to South Africa and I would get the right soil and I would get the Durban poison and I would go to Alaska and I would grow it in that local soil and I would put the magic light over it and dial the light in until it was like the right latitude. Uh, but, but I wouldn't uh, try to get the Appalachian Durban poison, right? right? Because the reason for the Appalachians, like you're not protecting the IP around the place. The IP, the soil is the IP. Right, yeah. right. They're, they're protecting their local and, soil. And, and, you, and, couldn't, and, and yeah. you couldn't get an no, Appalachian. You couldn't, and you, you couldn't, couldn't also. You couldn't get an Appalachian right. around it. And, and, right. and what we're doing in Appalachian development is experience-driven, right? So it's like come experience the cultural heritage of the region as well. So I mean, it's like we're diversifying. You know, a lot of us up there, you know, we it's back to the landers. We're economic refugees. We came up there for a simpler way of life. We like to build our own shit. Like, this is what we want to do. We want to share that with the world. We want to share our permaculture knowledge. We want to share our strain development knowledge. We want to share the history, heritage. We want to we want to feed you, right? You know, we want all of these things, and that's what we're doing. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we're not in the same market as these guys. I'm not, I'm not worried about big agra coming in and ruining our, our region because at the end of the day, I mean, we're capped at 10,000 square feet. We're, and we're geographically isolated to a point with why would big ag... And you're wanna, organic. Yeah, well, ex exactly, beyond organic. And it's why would, we, why would big ag want to go two and a half hours on the backside of fucking Iron Peak, you know what I'm saying, to, to get a 10,000 square foot grow for a commodities market it doesn't even make sense yeah but so, can you survive selling your flour to your to your neighbors i mean that is where yeah well, no it's not to our neighbors so you know in in, in initiatives and i don't like self you know self promotion or whatever but it's like your it. initiatives of micro branding your brands like so we are taking it's mic it's micro branding so so we take small brands right we take people out of the hills we incentivize them to start off in the branding space. Now, there's an evolution to that, which is cooperatives, right? So they start off, everyone wants to be king of the hill, everyone wants to be king of the castle, I did it the best, I do it the best, I am the best, and then all of a sudden they realize, they're like, hey, can you sell my weed? You know, and it's like they're starting to depend on their neighbors again, like they always have, and so the cooperative forms. Now, the cooperative may be a series of micro brands acting, as multiple, we're seeing that with True Humble, but still has little monikers on, or the little tags for each one of the farms, or Arcana, everyone wants their own three sisters, all these different things, you know. Now we've got uh, Emerald Groans coming out, they're, they're, you know, they're gonna be a ton of micro brands, you know, but then you have Flocana, which started out, hey, we're going to be a bunch of micro brands. And they're like, well, maybe we're going to be one big brand. And so then you have a co an agriculture cooperative that shows up like Flocana. So then you have this one big brand of, of weed called Flocana goes out onto the shelves. So you have, you know, small micro brands, micro brands acting as a cooperative, and then you have larger cooperatives of farmers acting as a single brand. It's, it follows the coffee model, it follows the wine model. I mean, but the appellation of origin and the control and the governance behind the IP protections for each one of these regions actually gets to dictate the standards of quality in which they are allowed to grow in that region. So they, they actually make their own rules. The state doesn't hand down a set of rules. I've been with CDFA now for three weeks traveling around the state. I saw you up in Humboldt, you know? It's like, we were just out in Palm Desert. Palm Desert said, we're not gonna be in Appalachian. I said, good, because you're doing it on stolen water. You know, it's like, they don't want it. They don't, they, <laughs> it's like, that's, yeah, yeah, good luck. You know, but the idea is they have, they want a geographical indication, right? Grown in the desert, not of the desert, because they're not grown of the desert, right? 
So these AOCs that are forming these collectives, these cooperatives that set their own rules, that set their own standards themselves, get to govern it. This is an attractive, you know, this is a proposition to a consumer that can only get that product in one place, only one place, right? It can be distributed to small, you know, dispensaries around, but the product can't be produced at a scale that can feed the masses. Let them have the Central Valley, unfortunately, you know, but let us have the small, the craft, the artisanal. Let's take that model. Let's take that market. That's our market. And, it, and, it, and you know, and I don't think we're worried at all. I mean, you don't it, think you have to move stuff down to the city? I am, but fuck, dude. Yeah. You know, okay, so I surf. <laughs> I surf right now 14 days out of 28. The other 14, I'm up with my kids. The reason I, I'm down here surfing Venice Breakwater almost every single morning and every single night is because I have to be down here selling weed. Like, this is where the market is. This is where I have to bring cannabis. I, I wish to God I could just meet somebody at the end of my driveway, get a duffel bag of cash, and give them a freaking duffel bag of turkey bags, and, and, and let that go. It, Those I mean, are the days. I mean, oh, oh, uh, oh, you know, oh you know, Justin. Yeah, right, right. Oh. I'll meet you at the third gate. I'll leave the second one open, all right? And I'm not giving you the code. And we didn't even count the cash <laughs> yeah, either because you knew the, the guy. Yeah, yeah, you right? knew the guy. No, uh-uh. But I mean, and you know, so the idea is, is like those days are over. We're down here, down here with jars of fucking weed, tons of all my friends and neighbors. And it's, now we're becoming business people. We're becoming politicians. We're becoming consultants. We're becoming everything we never wanted to be just to survive. But the thing is, is we are going to survive. Like but, are you, but are you growing uh -huh. high numbers? Are you selling high numbers? Or is, are you falling into that trap? High numbers? Yeah. Well, I mean, I say you scale, you fail. I mean, it's like, so, so, so no, we're not selling high numbers. We're trying to sell at high margins. No, no, I meant, I meant your, 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 your TAC numbers. No, I mean, I, I'd say, I'd say, I would Some. say, I would say. There's would a diversity, say, there's a diversity, say the diversity in your lines, right yeah. Now that, you know, that, that at dispensaries, I just got a COA back from Big Rock Farms, the 22%, everyone's like, oh my God, I'm only going to take 50 of those. You know, take, you know, you know, you know, 100 of those. I, that's what I want, the 22%. I want a 21%, I'll take the 22%. You know, yeah, numbers are still driving, driving yeah. the market. We got, some, we got some questions coming in. Well, Kevin, you and I have talked about this for hours. So, um, and you guys kind of touched on it. I hate also, sorry, it's Lance Mowgli. <laughs> um, you know, you guys, I hate comparing our industry to alcohol, but it's true micro and macro. And Justin and I just talked about this on a boat in Long Beach the other day. Um, I think that's the only way it has to go. And Justin's spot on with that. There's something that can't be emulated on what's going on in the triangle. That's what's going to make it unique. He introduced me to Hidden Prairie Farms. By far the best fire blue Skittles I've ever had, and it'll stay that way, and I'll pay all the money for what we just talked about. Used to getting free product, but there's some product you're willing to pay for if you don't make it yourself. But what do you guys think about as far as the evolution beyond the micro macro? You're talking about the race to the top, which is sad for the states that everyone's, to your point, 34, 35, 38 percent. Who knows if it's real on THC? When do you think the, the 2.0 is going to come in? where it stops being a race, it stops being the dumb question of indica, sativa, or hybrid, and it gets into more of uh, what's your terpene profile? Is myrcene for the win? Is lemony? What is it for you? And, and I kind of know your answer, Kevin, but I think everyone would like to hear because I'm on the same page. I, I, think, yeah, I think that for the craft regions, it's really about getting, and, it, and it's beginning, it's, it's, it's to get the people. See, remember, most of these craft regions, like Humboldt's a, a really good example because Humboldt's is, is unique in California in terms of ownership of property. So most of California has a disproportionate amount of state and federal land versus private ownership. Humboldt has the most private ownership of any, any county in California, which means that people really haven't seen Humboldt County. So it's, it's just words. It's coming from Humboldt. What does that mean? And so what you're seeing right now, though, is the first time where we've been able to work with the, the, the people who run Humboldt County in terms of tourism and in Humboldt Made and in the ability to get people to come in and start to really be exposed to the farms directly. So we're working so heavily on the tourism aspect to allow individuals to come in and start to experience what the farmer has to offer because the farmer can have a conversation. Now, the, the, the way we're working it is the farmer can have the conversation. Someone like me has to sell the products. I have the license. But all I'm doing is selling the product that the farmer's convincing the people that they want to try based off of what the individual is asking for. And so when I, when, I, when I look at storefronts, the person who controls the destiny of your farm is someone who's making under $15 an hour. 
right? So if under $15 an hour, they're controlling the success <laughs> of your farm because they're a bud tender. And that's not meant in any disrespectful way about money or in skill. It's just that it's, it's somebody who's at the counter is being asked questions. So few people actually come in and ask for something specifically. Only a couple companies have that type of market penetration. And it, it comes down to the individuals have to start to want to know the product they're buying from who's creating it and based off of what these individuals are trying to create. And so I think that the craft regions, in, in as we go forward, the way you get around this lack of understanding is to allow the tourism to increase, which it's beginning, and, and we can see it clearly now. And they're starting to come in, and you allow the farmers to, to, to actually converse with these people so they can ask the farmer, what are you growing? What are you doing? What do you recommend for me for what I'm seeking? Because it isn't just about a single terpene. It's not about, um, I just want this. For maybe for opiate replacement, it kind of is. And we can say that limonene drives you, drives you up, and we can say carophylline drives you down. And so we can make broad generalizations based off of how we see terps. But fundamentally, you want to be able to have the farmers who are cultivating and working on their own diverse varietal packages things that make them unique in terms of, I don't grow the same thing Justin does, and I might desire to send you a different direction, but when the people come in, they're allowed to see these things, experience them, and then they do the word of mouth. They're the ones that drive that direction forward. They're the ones that go back to their home of origin and say, man, I said, I got some killer weed. This was the company that I got it from. And what happens is, those companies only produce certain amounts. So say Justin's farm does 500 pounds, and we just talked about a farm that's gonna do 200,000. Well, what happens is, why can't you do pre-buys? Because we do that with other products. I'm in wine clubs. I order wine in and hold it, and, and, and there's other things in life that we, that we work with. I call it the Ferrari model, because the Ferrari model is you got 300 orders for cars, and you only made 200 of them. And the other 100 guys, sorry, you missed out. And it doesn't seem to hurt Ferrari very badly. And what it does is they've created a demand for a thing that makes people want a thing, and it makes them commit to this thing, and it allows you then to sell that thing at a higher price point and have an ability to sell all your product. I think a lot of these craft farms, I don't think they should even be putting them in eighths. Yep. So, I think it should be an ounce only. Yeah. So what you were saying about bud tenders, so we have like three separate projects now in Oregon because we're realizing the truth of what you said. We have like three separate projects now in Oregon to educate bud tenders. <coughs> well, the, like, these people are putting together like reams of educational content and doing bud tender certifications so that, because we are super dependent on those guys. They're the gatekeepers. Oh, completely. And, and reaching out to them and getting them to drive the market in a new way, that, that's the easiest pressure point right now. And we gotta do that. We should all be pulling behind that, like making sure that the brand is carried into the shop the bud tender understands the brand, can talk about it, can talk about the different varieties. And when someone comes in, they steer them towards something more intelligent, and then the market will evolve. It's tough for a lot of the stores, though, because you got, like, I use an example as of uh, some stores I go to, they got 400 flower choices. Well, Jesus Christ, how does any bud tender know 400 goddamn choices? Well, that's... Like, that no, mean, no, for real, for real, like... The, the, why do they carry so much flour? Because, no be, because ultimately they, they believe that that varietal is, is needed in terms of um, who's coming and they want to catch everybody because it's so competitive. And, and if you're really doing legit business with your facilities where you're permitted, you know, basically you're, if you're breaking even, you're doing pretty goddamn good now. To me, this whole model is an assimilation model where you're building something to be sold in a couple of years. This isn't about running a business like traditional business where I make X amount of money, I have X amount of profit, we move forward. Most of these places are being built on a for sale basis where you're building some kind of vehicle that you can unload to a larger conglomerate down the road. It favors that model. If you take a look at it, to me, it's Walmart model. It's, it's a couple percentage points of profit, and if you can f deal with it, you're gonna do great, but if you're not, you're screwed. And so they're trying to shotgun approach who they're selling to. And I think what you have to have is you have to have the ability for storefronts in specific areas to say, you know, we're, we're Mendocino-based, where you have a, a shop in Venice that works off of Mendocino farmers specifically. And what it does, it allows them to, or the Appalachian farmers, where these three Appalachians we believe have superior product of these products. And of those Appalachian farmers, we believe these three farmers have the right product of this product. 
So you, what you, you hear about Appalachian, about collectives mm -hmm. trying to get retail, right? Yes. So you have a, you'll have some kind of humble collective that has a shop in LA, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like an embassy. Exactly. It allows you, and, and, and then you bring a brand ambassador down, someone who's able to sit there and educate the people on, hey, these are how they produce it. These are the different directions, and a lot of it is trying to get people to experience some of it. And I think I think one of the one of the the tricks of it is 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 you do steam derived terps and you put it in a in a water bottle. Because that's the only way you're going to get anybody to taste this shit legally. And so we messed around with it, where we steam pulled terps off the varietals, put it into a water bottle. That's legal. Yep. Now you can taste what that variety tastes like with no legal issues. And just, just to let you know also that you know, what we're doing right now, what we have evolved from the events not being able to happen this year, is we've made something called an outpost, right? So we put all the brands in like a kiosk and have the brand ambassadors come down and actually like do education pieces. But even that, because the distributors have dis the distributor model, too. The distributors are, you know, 200, 500 SKUs, right? They go into the shop, and they've got all these SKUs. They've got these price sheets. They've got everything like that. And I, I went across the street. Across the street is the Ease headquarters. I guess heard of Ease, right? Like right across the street, that big, giant castle is, is Ease. And, um, and I went in there with a bunch of farm product, a little farm box with super cute little stamps and, and all the a Humboldt magazine, Appalachians map, you know. I'm like, hi, you know, you want to buy our weed? And they were like, we're buying six dollar eighths. It's like, I was like, oh shit. That's like 300, that's like 300 dollar pounds and less with taxes and, and distro and all of those things. So it's like, so price, right, is driving because these people are trying to push it all out. So it, it, it's like, we're we're up against like this market is going the price per per unit is going down right that's driving a lot of the business inside the retail the retailers are trying to push this out you know so it's like it's about education but it's about each and every single one of you going in and demanding higher quality products mm -hmm. it's about us it's about us defining those quality markers like we have to, we have to like you know Frenchie was like with the hash wheel, M uh, Max Montrose I'll give him a shout out you know with the with the interpreting guide mm -hmm. you know it's like and you know Tim Blake for the love of Christ put pressure on Tim Blake to release the cup data you know of all the of, of all the of all the of all the you know the the judging cards. Mm -hmm. All of those markers, we start speaking that language in unification like every single one of us. We can demand bud tenders to actually give us a higher quality product and brands to produce that higher quality product. You just gotta get, it. The, the problem with that the, is that you're, if you really want a good bud tender, the best bud tender is really the grower yeah. because they're the ones that know the product best. And so it's trying to get the, the level of information to the end user and you have to target it geographically where you go. For all the years that I did you know, illicit uh, sales for nursery work, um, when people ask me, uh, that's, where, that's where Senator McGuire came in. He came and asked me, he goes, how do you choose your varietals? And I said, you want the answer I'm, you know, I tell you, or you want the, or you want the real answer? Yeah. And he goes, I want the real answer. I said, I, I take a look <coughs> regionally, and I take a look through the whole United States, and I determine what's moving in the U.S. Yep. And I study the U.S. as a total market. And then when you come in to do business with me, I ask you privately where you move in the weed. And if you tell me you're moving it to Chicago, I know what to put you into. If you're moving it to Florida, I know what to put you into. I know what to put you into because regions have desires. And I think with cannabis, what you're doing is we're throwing, and there's nothing wrong with this. People that have lower income levels shouldn't be forced to buy more expensive cannabis because we want to get paid a fair price for it. Because in every object in life, you can find a price, price gradient. And I think that what we have to do is really steer ourselves into people that are more discerning. And so that's why I believe that when you work off of these craft models, less is more, and you get a higher price because you're trying to target a very different user. You're not trying to get everybody in the country to smoke your weed. You're trying to get people that really have enough income to smoke a higher quality product. And we, we don't have enough price differentiation at all. Like, not right now. One, it's all in the same bucket. One, like, there's like a thousand X range, right? Of, um, and with cannabis, like, we just haven't figured out how to walk into... We haven't figured out how to walk into a store and be like, this is a $200 eighth because it's fucking worth it. Like, in every other mm -hmm. product, it, it's like that. We just haven't... We haven't had the balls maybe yet to just, to just set up a store and to grow in a supply chain and just be like, this is so much better it's I not the delivery. balls, it's the funding 
to, to, to actually do it because at the yeah, end the of the education. day, yeah, it's the education. But at the end of the day, I did the math. When you and I used to work together, I remember the most money I ever made was when you, the OGSD, yeah. right? I'd fill a greenhouse for the OGSD and I'd worked in two different markets. I got to clear it out. But when I went with the diamonds, with the, with the diamond OG, mm -hmm. I, I got a third of what it was that I was doing. So it was like, so I had to grow that OGSD because I could sell it. Uh, it would it would move. It wasn't exactly you know it wasn't a desired trade, but it would move as in the fuel market, and I could grow m three times as much of it. So it was like so it's like it, we we were we're economic we're, we're driven by economics as well. It's like what produces the most and 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 I know, but it, it's the job demand. of the small grower to to grow. It will be to grow the stuff that doesn't produce the most, but is extraordinary, and you can I'm just and you're getting that kind of price reward, yeah. right? Yeah, pro, back then, the, of course. In the prohibition model, that's what it is. We're just so not coming out of that fast learn, enough, you know. know. Well, it's gonna Fuck, it's gonna it. take time though. I mean, wine people had to drink it, or they would have died of uh, toxic water. So I mean, fermented drinks. I mean, Christ, beer was <laughs> beer was a breakfast drink. And so the, the, it could still be a breakfast drink. Yeah, it still is. But the but the point of it is is that you 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 have to be able to take the time, and that's the problem is that we don't have time, we, or you don't feel like we have time. But I know that as people start to become exposed to cannabis, and you start to buy these cheaper products, you're going to say, "Hey, how come that wasn't the stuff I used to smoke prior?" And you're going to desire it, and you're going to realize, you know what? I could smoke an ounce of this shit, and it wouldn't be as satisfying as an eighth of the other. So therefore, what's the difference in price? It, it, it's like all things. You you drink in certain amount. That's not a Budweiser. You got a you got some kind of little micro IPA in front of you. It, it's a it's a choice that was made. A little devil head on it. This guy is investing. Right, Kevin, in we got we got an China. audience oh, question. Oh, we got questions. I'm right. sorry. Okay. Hey guys, thank you so much for coming through. You guys are all super knowledgeable. You know, giving us all a ton of stuff. Um, I have a question on consumers. You guys are. Not you guys, you specifically, Kevin, seem to be mixed on consumer because um, you, you seem to say that the bud tender has a ton of power, but at the same time you're saying that they go home and, and they decide. So at the end of the day, don't you think that the consumer is going to know what they want? They might be pushed something, but just because there's a hottie and a Hornitos uh, you know, cutoff doesn't mean I'm going to order Hornitos. Tequila. No, it's not a hottie and a horninos. It's that when you're when you're running a storefront, it isn't everybody that comes in is so cognizant of what they want. So m most of the time, people ask, "What do you have? Can you recommend me something?" And what they recommend typically is something that they have a connection to in some form. So if you're a good farmer in terms of business skill. You make a relationship with the people who are selling your product, and that's where this distributor model sucks, in my opinion, oh, yeah. because they're just sticking this shit in the shelf. The farmer has to actually go to the <coughs> bud tenders, show them the product that they cultivate, tell them why they, they grow what they grow, give them the information about what makes it different, let them experience it in some capacity, because now what the bud tender has is a, is a memory of that relationship. When I walk into stores that have hundreds of choices, I go, give me something gassy, give me something fruity, and give me something you like. And they go, okay, this gassy one is what seems to be moving most. We seem to get the most satisfaction on the, on the repeat buy. And then this is the same for the fuel. So what we're doing is I'm asking them, and this is a game I'm playing. I'm just playing to see how are they choosing these things. And then the final one is what do you like yourself? What would you choose yourself for your own opinion, your own piece? Because then it lets me get an idea what the individual likes. And so it's... It's this person who's selling the product at the front of the counter. You have to be able to differentiate yourself as a farmer, grower, whatever you want to call yourself, <clears throat> to that individual. Because otherwise you just fit into a jar like all the others. And that's the part that matters, is that in any single storefront you walk into, it's the person who's being paid the least amount of money who has the most amount of influence on the sale of your that's product. Right. I mean, in Oregon, the consumers don't know what they want. People keep saying that. But do you think they'll learn? Is my question. Oh, they'll, yes. they'll learn if the bud tenders teach through, them through education. The bud tenders can teach them. Yes, the farmer has to teach the bud tender, though, really about why the, the product is different. Because it can't be the distributor. Because the distributor, how the hell are they going to know seven hundred products? They don't even smoke. Half these guys don't even smoke weed. So it, it, it's it's you're letting people who don't even smoke weed dictate your success of your business. But that's why I tell the farmers, listen, you got to go to every dispensary. Don't go through the distributor in the conventional sense. Go to the stores, make the connections as the farmer, and then find a distributor to sell to them. So the consumers but, 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 who like Pinot Noir but were maybe. sold Pinot Noir at a certain point. Is that what you're saying? Because I'm asking... 
they know they like Pinot Noir from trying it, from learning, from yeah. experimenting, not because they walked in and the Hornitos chick gave them Hornitos and that's what they're but, about. But, but, but they a tried lot of it and they learned they like, they like Pinot, right? But partially both. Some people know that they tried it and liked it someplace and they come in and ask for it. But a tremendous number of people come in and ask the, ask the person selling it, what do you recommend? I have 20 choices in front of me. What's your opinion? The, the bud tenders in Oregon say that it's like being a bartender in a bar and every single person who comes in says, what should I drink? Bars aren't like that anymore. <coughs> well, but for I, now, though, but for now. Is I'm lucky to have a different bars experience aren't like that, with right? it. Because, I, you know, we now. give out, I, I think we give out 50 to 100 dispensary comps, mostly to bud tenders, to Emerald Exchange right. events, to come and meet the farmers. And then we're, we're nonstop giving samples. We're like, if we find out you're a bud tender, we're like, we're, we're you know, we're hanging out with you. I have a different experience with bud tenders. When I'm walking in, you know, to a, to a space, I'm usually with a brand or, or mm -hmm. doing something different. So it's like, it's education to me to see now in the LA market when I, you know, watching how many products are coming out, how many products are available, and how important it is that we do ask for what it is that we want. Like, as consumers, so media is becoming huge. So the media outlets, partnerships with media, telling people the story of the strains that we want. And I know that that's one of the things that you know I've noticed when being in the LA marketplace is like, hey, how is it that we get what it is that we want, right? What, what, how does it we ask these questions? And the bud tenders seem to be, to me, more educated than what you guys, like, and I don't know, I'm just coming from a different place. Maybe it's coming from the Emerald Exchange place, but I think that, I, I, I don't know, like, I just see a different view vantage point. I mean, I think that there. I think that we are starting to find people that are like. Oh, it's, indica, be, it's beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's, like, it's beginning. Yeah, yeah, but I, it's I, it's not to the point where you have an ability for the customer to know exactly what yeah. they like. What you what they what they can tell you though is how they want to feel. Yeah. What kind of effect do they want to achieve from the product that they're buying? So they can tell you, hey, I want something that makes me feel uplifted. I, I would like something to relax me. I want to have some a sleep aid. I'm, I'm hungry. I'd like to be able to have a, a, a appetite stimulation either up or down. So they can tell you this information. But for so many individuals, they used to score on weed, just score on weed. And half the stuff that they were buying was mislabeled. That's what Phylos lets you find out. Half the stuff you were smoking really wasn't what you thought you were smoking. And still isn't. And still yeah, isn't. Still That's mislabeled. the point. So when you go in and you talk to your bud tender, you're buying Blue Dream. You don't have any idea whether that's Blue Dream, and your bud tender doesn't either. I mean, and so so part of the but, answer. But if there was a really smart bud tender who had smoked that stuff right. thoughtfully, and right. it was called Blue Dream, but he was like, "This is what you want." Now I know that after talking to you, and it was called Blue Dream. Right. I mean, I shouldn't say this, but if there was that connection. That'd be just fine what if you could oh, have I a agree. bartender who could lead you in that I agree. way. I agree. And one of the ways they get there, I think, is because they'll have a certification by your company. Or then they'll or start some, to know without having exactly. to smoke it so much. So there are seven or eight different kinds of, you know, people, we know it, but most people don't know Kush. They don't know that Afghan was, was, was for, you know, making hash, and so it gives you a different kind of high. Most people don't know that. Now, I'm a member of the Garden Writers of America. We represent, we reach 85 million people a week. So last year was the first time they ever had a talk on cannabis. They would never let anybody talk about cannabis. So there are no newspaper articles by regular garden writers and you know who would reach normal people. Yeah, you got the Oregonian has their, you know, their bud tender page and everything else with the you know where they try to make it sound like it's a wine and blah blah blah. But that's not the right kind of education that we need right now. We've got people that are they want to smoke the weed. They really don't even know what to ask other than, yeah, I want to be uplifted or, you know, couch locked. Those are the two things they know. And, and so all of this stuff has to change. And one of the ways I think we change is by not wasting our time. So, for example, we have this 420 day, which gets more publicity than you can possibly <coughs> garner for free for the industry. What do we do on 420? We party. You know, we could use 420 Day to change the name from marijuana to cannabis. We could, we could find three or four different things, you know. 420 Day, everybody who, who's thinking about smoking cannabis ought to read this article or this week. There's a way we could unify the way to reach people as an industry. Jeff? We talk to ourselves. We don't really get the people who are out of the industry. Did, did you say that the Garden Writers of America 
reach 85 million people a, a week. week. Really? On TV, radio. That's awesome. 85 million people a week. <laughs> and so I got... You're, a, you're the new outlet for the cannabis industry. You're right. We're going to be leaning on you heavily. <laughs> you're right, except we've got another problem there. So, so, so High Times decides, hmm, Dope Magazine, maybe we better buy that. We're going to see the same kind of consolidation in the media industry involving this. You know, we've got about a hundred different cannabis magazines now. They're all the same, you know. But at least we got a hundred different ones. They could be different, and, and and you know now we're going to end up with two or three. And so, but yeah, these are the things we have to do. But I I want to go back to that 420 idea. It is a day that's there. It is written about in every newspaper. It is on every television station. 420. Oh my God! What an opportunity for us, and we blow it every year. Well, we're just all really high on, that, on that day. Well, <laughs> all right, we, we should we got figure out like what to do. Ten more questions. So, all, all, right, right, all question. right, question. Sorry. <laughs> Hi guys, um, Sundarajan here. I'm new it's to really, the. It's really dark. Are you, the, are you the guy with dark. the atomic light? I'm, I'm actually very dark. <laughs> He's the light guy. I'm the, the, I'm the guy. only <laughs> dark guy here. Actually. Oh, uh, I thought that was just because <laughs> of the lighting. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mowgli. I appreciate that. All right. um, so I'm very new to the industry, and and first I want to say thank you guys for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, there seems to be for me uh, a different uh, pivot point. It's a plant. It's a living plant. It seems to me, and when we talk about numbers, high THC, every plant, it seems to me, from what I'm learning, every strain is different. Everybody that smokes it, takes it, because we're all individuals, have different effects with it. And so to have a discussion on one particular one on how you like it, don't like it, is one thing. The other, and it's gonna, there's a question here. Uh, the other thing is that the medicinal part of this, no matter whether you're a wreck, whether or not, it's still a medicine in the sense that whether it's a health or whether it's a physical ailment, it's a medicine, right? And we know that. I'm from India, and I know <laughs> my ancestors have been using it, in fact, my grandfather as well, for a long time. So what I see also from the outside is a lot of camaraderie that happens and a, a whole lot of a less amount of collaboration, not only in the educational part of this, but also treating that plant like it should be in the sense of nature, how nature is. So what I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out and from you guys is, you talk about pricing, you talk about keeping that edge in the marketplace, and Mowgli, I hear you very loud and clear. You've gotta make that plant very quality that people will come. The growers that have used, I, I, I'm not just trying to plug the plasma light, but they've kept their price up in Oregon because they can do and get the numbers and get full entourage effect, full profile. So what I'm asking, I guess, is when you go indoors like this, trying to do biomimicry, trying to do that and get the full expression of those specific land races you're trying to go back to, what is the process that you're currently using to do that? And is everybody doing it like in a vacuum and then trying to figure it out so they can get an edge? Or is there a group that's literally working towards getting more of the same kinds of medicine out to everybody that really need this medicine? Not just, I mean, I smoke, don't get me wrong. I enjoy it too. But you know what? I can just get it from my grower, the guys I know, so I can supply myself. But the medicinal kind of grow, the kind that really are helping veterans out, the kinds of cancer patients and all these, where's the group that actually does that as a collaboration? And how do you guys think that should be done? That's my question. I think traditionally that's been done by a lot of us behind the scenes because you're, when you're talking about medicine that veterans and ill and stuff like that, they're broke. And so, you know, from my situation, that's why I've given out so much friggin' money because how do you, how do you ask somebody who has nothing to give you something? <coughs> and so you're, you're, that's, a, that's a charity situation, which is very difficult for, for regular people to do because it's, you're having to subsidize it. Yeah, but that's, that's you, Kevin. But, you know, but, you no. know. So, so now there's companies, right, that are trying to do that. They're trying to make 
you know, they're trying to have proprietary plants that have unusual cannabinoids and they make oil from it and they work with doctors and they try to bring it to patients and and it's it's rough to watch them because they they're they're trying to help patients and they're also simultaneously trying to build all this IP and they're conflicted in various ways and they don't have any data on the actual medicine they're giving patients and it's not a collaborative thing it's a handful of companies that are very focused on the medical space and it's, mean, it's not like it should be. No, that's that's big business, though. The medical end is the money. Yeah. No, I but mean, you that's, know, that, that, it, when you're talking about how do you help, you, you, it wasn't about how do you drive medical. You said how do you help specific groups. When you say the word help, that doesn't mean charge. Help is help is like come over and help me. If I pay you, that's a job. And so when you're talking about help, then then it has to be where. <laughs> I mean, we had ideas where you had these regions, like our regions, where X amount of the product that came off of your farm was put into a, a, a general fund, and it was allowed to be distributed so that you only had X amount. So, you know, if you did 90% of the crop was for sales so that you could keep your farm alive, and then 10% of the farm was given to these type of situations, then you'd have some ability. It's just that it's tough because you've got to pay tax on these products. You can't just give anything away anymore. So none of this stuff is easily to give away. You've got to pay all the taxes on it, the excise tax. You've got to pay production costs. So it's, it's extremely expensive to do what you're saying in the modern world. We, I mean, we went at this ag as aggressively as possible while we had the chance, but I think that until you're able to create these... Uh, larger operations that can get some of the prices down on genomically sorted medical varieties on how we want to define medical, say it's in a specific direction. I don't use the word medical variety very often. I think it's, it's all cannabis. It's how you use it. And so the, I think the problem is that when it comes to these lower income people, I, I don't think America really gives a shit because I, I had to step over three homeless to get in here. So when I see homeless laying in the street, I don't think people really weren't about s providing cannabis to people. And we were caught up in it because we were, we were caught up in it because we were just uh, sensitized to it because these are people that you are around. You see your neighbors that need help. So all of a sudden it starts to make you more aware. Then you have strangers come to you for help and it makes you more aware. But we're in corporate cannabis in California. This is this is a different animal. Kevin, I, I give I give weed to everybody out here on the street. You do? <laughs> oh hell yeah! All right. That's, that's oh, why yeah. the guy was All lying the, on the ground. The, 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 <laughs> lying on the ground. No, yeah. No, I mean we we've actually had weed church, which is really cool. Where we're like on Sunday, like we like sat down and we're just sitting there. We smoked a joint, and the next thing you know, we're driving mandalas on the road inside. But it, but 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 I definitely like it's a that's a hundred. That's man. so good. Like, we don't that's have, so good. Well, my ex wife used to say like I was the only person. That could because Dr. Courtney gave me an ACDC strain and I got it through Jude Tillman, and then all of a sudden I got their phone numbers and everybody was giving me the phone numbers, they, or they gave their my number to, to everyone else. And my ex wife was like, Dude, you figured out how to turn our square footage into a non profit. And I was like, well, You know, because the, at the end of the day, how do you charge? It's not just veterans, because if you want to do veterans, I mean, the compassion programs that we're, you know, supporting through CGA and weed, uh, the Weed for Warriors program, that's extremely important to support that at any cost. I mean, that the compassion programs to stay alive, the way it was written in the state, we just got the new regs dropped. We're allowed now to, to, yeah, to just, have. Yeah, they to signed have, it in. We're, we're now allowed to give our, you know, to be destroyed cannabis to compassion programs, which is great. But um, <coughs> further things like the, you know, not supporting CBD isolate and hemp derived CBD, full spectrum CBD products, um, because you have brands moving into the CBD space and they're saying, oh, fuck it, it's available in an <coughs> isolate form at pennies in the dollar. So you have people like myself or Jude Tillman who were, were running compassion programs where we were giving away tons of CBD medicine to, to patients, to children with epilepsy or people with cancer or anti-inflammatory conditions. We were, or autoimmunes. And, you know, now we can't because it, I mean, at, at the cost of, you know, of regulation and the square footage we're given, we can't afford to grow it anymore. And it, so, it, and, you know, if we were to sell it, which I've never sold CBD in my life either, I'm one of those, I, I, could, I just couldn't do it. I, I wish that there was a way to, you know, maximize square footage, but at the end of the day, you just can't do that. You can't sell it to kids. Um, but, you know, now we have to support those programs, those compassion programs. We have to support, you know, we, you know I, I, would, I have to say, at, you know, asking your local dispensaries, asking your local politicians and everyone, you know, getting involved in compassion is the biggest thing that we have right now 
because these big hemp companies are coming in and they're just driving the full spectrum out of, out, you know, out of business. And yeah, I didn't mix two messages there, but don't buy CBD isolate. We have the we have the first we have the first farm in Oregon. Uh, it's a hemp farm. Yeah. Full they make full spectrum CBD tincture, uh, and it's the first cannabis farm that's a B Corp. Yeah. And they're fucking awesome. Yeah. B Corp's a good way to go. Yeah. You know the other way sin is legalization. We got to get more states to legalize. Simple as that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, and I think the Oregon exper- experiment, in a way, has resulted in fifty dollar ounces. Which, which is pretty compassionate when you, you get down to $50 ounces. We've been so. accidentally compassionate. Yeah, accidentally We didn't mean to be so compassionate. Right, 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 right. But I, but I, but I do think more legalization. And I, did I hear today that the, that the federal government finally said CBD is now yeah. not Schedule it's not 1? Schedule it's not Schedule 1. Scheduled CB, yeah, that is you know, a big deal. <laughs> that's a very big deal. And, and again, we've we got to make sure that whatever it goes into, you know, we're able to control how it's how it's done and unfortunately that not so easy but all right next next question did, did that answer your question yes. okay <laughs> okay yeah. also uh, you know just to say thanks kevin we're gonna wants to hold my hand now <laughs> i just wanted an excuse to hold his hand i know you do it's all right i love you that's too that's how i usually i just usually just mm-hmm. take the hand. anyway we got like five minutes just to say so uh, recently, you guys have been talking about shrinking profits. You've been talking about uh, general education of the consumer and stuff like that, and educating um, you know your bud tenders and stuff. But as a like, let's say you're a dispensary owner, you've got you carry 20, 30 brands, you know, and you've got let's say five bud tenders, you know. Let's say that brands were able to afford sales reps, and they were bringing sales reps to your dispensary. Would you have the time, and would you be able to educate all of your employees on 30 different brands? Um, would you have the space in your uh, dispensary to allow like literature of a general education about your brand or about other brands. You know, I, I think that a big issue is not that dispensary owners can't, they just, they just can't afford it. You know, there's a lot of things and I'm not a dispensary owner. I don't know. So I, I feel like you guys have way more experience. You know, we, we, we were just talking about, I got approached by a bunch of my uh, pot- partners that are farmers that don't have stores. And they asked me if I could um, move their product since we've uh, changed the, the classifications on where you can sell. And so my thing was I wanted the farmers, I wanted them to send a rep with me. And so what it does is I can have a mobile storefront. So I can set up a storefront at these different locations that are allowed through whatever county we do. But I wanted the farmers to be present, someone from the farm to be present from that brand. It's, it's crucial. Because what I, I'm not trying to be the face of, the, of their brand. I'm just trying to be someone who sells their brand. I want the farmer to make the relationship with the customer we just happen to be a, a one of the sellers. And then what it does is it allows the individuals who are coming to buy cannabis to meet the farmers themselves. The farmers can then educate these people. And if you were doing your job as a store owner, then you 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 take the people that are your bud tenders <laughs> and you, you do put them through a system where you, you bring them to farms, you bring them to farmers, you let them get a good exposure. You gotta put in the homework. And I think that it's easier for us where we are because we have a proliferation of craft people around us. And so it allows it a lot easier for us to go up and check out. If I'm going to Ganja Rebels Farm Tuesday so I can check out all his products, we're going to carry some exclusive work of his, right? So, I mean, I know Dan forever. But I'm going to bring a couple of the guys with me so they can see what he's working with and they can see his new product line. So then this way they're educated on, you know, why we think it's good and why we think the public should enjoy some of it. And it would have, you know, gradients of, of uh, potency, different per- profiles, so that you have a true um, uh, choice selection. But it's the, it's the dispensary owner's job to educate the people who work in the facility so they know enough. And that, that's about your commitment to the industry long term. I think that with a lot of stores, it's just if you're in a good geographic area, you get a lot of turnaround, people coming through. I don't think that emphasis is placed as much. I think that um, Jeremy's dispensary in Oregon, uh, Pharma, I think that he shines at this. Every Monday, the whole staff sits down and they bring a scientist in to talk to them. Yeah, you know, he shines. He's got a really, really good thing. And, And Oregon is pretty unique in that way, where I think Oregon has a more developed craft system than California does by far. Oh, yeah. And... Even though California is the monster of the game, Oregon has a different level of appreciation of the finite details of the product. And I think that when I go and tour spots in, in Oregon, I see 
a higher level of knowledge from the people, but it's also they can be more intimate because you can also touch and play with the cannabis direct. California is different. Bite, Peter. That's your sound bite right there. California is different. California, you don't get a chance to touch this product. And so that's where you have to bring your workers that work for you to the location so they can actually see these products and get exposed to it. And the idea is to try to find a cluster of farms that you can work with that can provide you with product. Right now, it's brutal because you only have so many farms that are online. And distribution controls a lot of it, and it makes it very difficult for you to... I used to focus on, on local only, right? So I, I was a local only guy for years, and we were known for that, where we worked so hard to develop all these smaller brands, where we would advertise for you. We would actually create your brand because it, we had the ability. I had the money, and I had the resources. And so what it did is it allowed us to further... And people asked why, and I said, because fundamentally, I want to get their product because it's a better product. And if I can keep them alive, then I can keep selling their product. But that means we have to have a relationship in that form where the store owner and the farmer believe they're connected. Now, no one gives a shit who you are. It's, I just need product on the shelf. And so that's a, a, a very transient type of thought where it's anybody on the shelf is fine and it, it can't be viewed in that way. And so if you're a smaller operator and you have an ability to choose farms that you work with based off of the ethics that you believe that they should grow with and you have enough of them to give you a product diversity and you have enough of them to be able to give you sustainability over the course of a fiscal year then you can actually get a knowledge base on that and then you have to hold that line where you focus on those products and those things and that that requires a, a different view of cannabis business. And I would say 85% of the businesses in cannabis right now are here just to grab the cash. Yeah, so Kevin, you know, we, I don't we, fault it, but we, I don't think it's the right way to go. We identified that kink in the supply chain uh, with the exchange, so we created that Emerald Outpost. So what we now aggregated 25 plus brands. We aggregate all the brands in Northern California if we want. And what we've done is we've taken ambassadors and, and we've only linked four to five farms, like five being max. So that ambassador actually knows those five brands in and out, comes up to the farm, knows everyone visits the farm, and they can come down to the dispensary. As soon as we eclipse five brands per ambassador, we add another ambassador. The brands pay for the ambassador. They pay us a, ref a referral fee similar to brokering. Mm -hmm. Like we're brokers, essentially. We're not distributors. We saw that these, these products were just being dumped into distributors, we were visiting the distributors because we were trying to get the distributors into the exchange. We were visiting these distributors and we're like, holy crap, you've got all this shit sitting there. What are you doing with it? Our friends and neighbors aren't getting paid. No one's getting paid. And who the fuck is selling this? And no one from the distribution company, they couldn't. They had two, three guys out there with, you know, two, 400 SKUs on the shelves. So the idea is it's like the brands then pay the ambassadors, the ambassadors go to the dispensary. That's a good and model, then, man. Exactly. And then eventually what we're going to be doing once we allow for on-site consumption after 20, you know, after the January, the 2020 passed, that we're going to start bringing all the dispensary owners and everyone up there for full experience driven tourism models through the exchange and have that like full, you know, the, the, the full gamut, you know, for the, for the brands themselves. But yeah, I mean, it is, it is a thing. It's like you, right now, it's just another job that we've got, we gotta keep on, we gotta keep on moving. We cannot sit and let weed sit on the shelves. In Northern California, that is our bread and butter. That is, that is our mortgage payment. That feeds our dog. You know what I'm saying? Like that is our gas money. It's sitting on the shelves of a distributor some, somewhere in LA. Yeah, that sucks. But, but you, so, you bring up a good point though, that the dispensary has a much bigger responsibility than they're taking on. Yeah, they wanna make money, exactly. But you know, when you go in there and you're waiting to get in, there should be some better reading material than the crap that's sitting on it. There should be teeming with microbes, you know I mean? <laughs> uh, but, but there should be better reading material. There should be the regulatory agency should be helping with the education. When you leave dispensaries, you get the little card that says, you know, if you're pregnant, blah, you know, there's all that kind of stuff that, the, that they force on us. They could also force on us a little education. You need to know terpenes. You need to know the numbers. Right. So just so, just so you know, we're making a little science book. <coughs> We're going to give it out to dispensaries. There you Just go. Si it's going to be like weed science for civilians. Right. Just well, a little we pamphlet. Use, we use your galaxy at the nursery. So yeah. at the nursery, I got a, I got a 40-inch flat screen on the wall that just Beautiful. has the galaxy on it, yeah. right? Because we have a, a tremendous number of strains mapped. 
And what it does, it allows people to come in and start to see these relationships between varietals, and they can start to get their mind peaked on, hey, these things are connected, because really, the, you, sometimes you can only find certain things certain places, but you want to find something similar. And so what we want to be able to do is get you to understand, hey, these things are related, they're close. And that way, when you're in L.A., you might be able to find something that works for you like you did in Mendocino or in Humboldt or in Siskiyou or wherever you're at. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the individual who's buying the product to enjoy the experience of buying the product. And in that process, they start to become educated. But if you make it miserable, and, and I'm telling you right now, I'm somebody who loves to read. Most people don't like to read a damn thing anymore. So that's why I shoot so much video, because people really want it delivered. And what you can do then is you can give them, I give them all the strain info. So all the varieties, I give you a full digital breakdown of everything we're touching. So this way you can go home and look at it and come back and say, hey, I want to cultivate this, I want to do that. And I think that has to be done with a lot of the, the, the strains themselves. Most of the videos you see people smoking weed, it just doesn't give you the info you need. And that has to be done from, from a stability sense where it's easier as a nursery because I control the, the, the material. Right? And so I, I have this material. I can say, look, we're going to run it for this many years. We have it. But with purchasing products, it's constantly new turnover. And that's why I think that a lot of the stores, you have to kind of limit what you actually carry. I would rather see less choices at a shop, but better curated choices so and that you have a, 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 a better stability on, on how you sell it. And what how they much you know. know about it. Yes, and what you know about it so that you can really give a satisfaction to the user. So and then what they do is they become educated and they go to any shop and use that education. It's so not if, just us. If you think about the way wine works, like if, if you're a waiter in a restaurant and, and you have a good wine list. So that's, a, that's how I got to be a, a weed scientist, right? I, I was a waiter for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you work in a, in a restaurant that has a decent wine list, like you have to go to the tables all night long and you have to talk shit about the wine. And you have to have some idea what you're talking about. And so a good restaurant owner, every time there's a wine delivery, they sit down with their entire wait staff or the, or the person from the wine company and you taste everything and you talk about it and you learn about it. And then when you go to the tables, you're not an idiot, and you can actually steer people towards something they like. And if you don't steer them towards the thing they like, you know, then you, you don't make as much money. It's just like, it should be like that at dispensaries. Like, you have to educate yourself to sell something to somebody. It's hard with the weed, though, because with wine, you can spit that shit out. But with cannabis, you're not spitting that shit out. You're high. And so it, that's where, like, me and the wine industry have beef because... And we're training the tenders to go like this... <laughs> Not in here. That's, that's how Elon Musk smokes. <laughs> and and the, the, the thing is, you know, the individuals, that's why, that's why I believe that the farmer, I think that, that that's what we're trying to do in our own world. Is, and it, it's, it's the only way I can see this really taking place is that you start to have the farmers come into your facility more frequently. They're present. You advertise for them to be present. It allows individuals to start to meet the individuals who produce the product. They're able, they're actually able to consume with you off the site because they, they, they have an ability to have an ounce legally. On. I mean, this all has to work in legal shit. Everything we based our whole world off of was illegal. So, I mean, I'm somebody who's trying to figure out how do you not step in a legal bear trap and lose your license. And so much of it is to let the farmers come in. They can have an ounce in their hand that they're allowed to show you outside, that, outside the room. You can have a separate area where people can look at products. It can't be through the store. You can't open that product. That product has to leave in a sealed bag. All the criteria in California make it very, very hard to have an intimate experience. Change with, it. With, well, we get, then, I, and I feel you. Change it sounds great. Now go do that goddamn thing. But you're thing. doing it. But you're doing it. I know, but I'm not doing it quick enough. I'm I mean, not. you're going to be able to do you know, on-site consumption. Which Some places, it, it, it's, it's all about zoning, and it's about your county. And so just like someone says, we grow, California's legal. No, it's not. Go to, go to uh, Calaveras and tell me it's legal. So <laughs> it, it's a radically different situation depending where you are geographically. And because of that, you have to be able to find the loopholes that allow you to do it now or you won't be in business in a year to do it when it does change. And that's why I think that you have to be able to get your producers to come into the place and meet the, meet the, meet the buyers themselves and just make it casual to where it's a frequent situation. I mean, I'm lucky in the sense that the people that we have at my shop are career. 
So I pick career people, people that have been smoking for a while, and I bring in older people. I have 70-year-old women that work for me because I think that they're the most knowledgeable about medical cannabis of anybody I know. They know how to do holistic cannabis work better than anybody. And so I, I, I need that type of situation to occur in my world so that when people come in and are asking for, how do you use this? You can actually get people who have been helping people for 20, 30 years with, with medical type needs. But with, with the farmer coming in, the farmer's the only one that's gonna be able to get you to tie into this and understand it. Or otherwise the bud tenders, they, they have to be able to serve as like a liaison but they don't have to be hyper knowledgeable to the degree where they know every single product, because not every one of them wants to. So you can get someone who's phenomenal at customer service, but they don't. They only smoke very, very low potency weed, and if they do, they smoke a little bit of it at night when they go to bed. So how the hell are they gonna help you out selling any of these other products? They can't. And it makes it look like they're incompetent, but they're not. They're phenomenal representatives of your company, and they're, and they're great with people. It's just that you need to be able to bring in other people that can explain why they chose this. Why did you choose, you know, orange chewy berry? Because it makes this happen for me and, and then these people, and this is my antidotal. It, this number of people worked. When we looked at the terp profiles and the potency, we found it had unique ratios and it had unique cannabinoid compounds that we didn't see in other things. That's the education that lets the buyer realize, hey, that's what, that's what affected me. Now they know they can find similarities in other things. You're trying to give them an education, not just to buy stuff from you or from the farmers that you're selling for, but you're trying to give them an education to where any store they walk in, they have skills, and then any farmer they go to, they have an ability to work with. Because that's industry building. You know, it's not just you and one farmer. It's you're trying to build a new industry, but it's very difficult to do it the way we did it, where you could have an intimate relationship with the flower, where you could open it up, touch it, smell it, look it. Christ, we had a secret smoke lounge for years. People smoke it down. I can't do that anymore. I mean, they're going through my garbage. They dump out my trash. I've had the BCC at my, at my new shop three times since July. Three times. And we've, nev we've never had any problems. But I mean, I'm talking they're dumping the trash out, combing the goddamn trash. So when they're going through your trash, and that's part of their, that's part of their, well, they're allowed to, it makes it very hard to, to do anything that's not within a complete regulatory scheme. And so you have to get around it by bringing in other people from the outside that have an ability to be able to start making these connections. And I think that's where together as a culture, we should do well because we've historically been pretty cool. Even though we, not, we may not have done a lot of business you know, intimately, we did business when we needed to to make the, make the pounds move. And we historically got along in a pretty gentle, caring method. And that, I think that's the part that you have to bring forward to the public that they realize, whoa, I got you. Cannabis was always this kind of situation. And then that elevates them and lets them realize, I got you. I have to change the way I purchase. I don't just look at it to snap it up off the shelf. I actually take a second to get an education on it so this way I know what I'm looking for. And then I can go and find it at other places. And if we all had a, a, a common, you know, I say objective like that, you'd see a radically different change in how people perceived what they bought and how much they were willing to pay for what they bought. Is that a dog? It sounds like one. Yeah. All right, we got last question, then we got to wrap it up. Hello. So, oh. so I actually don't grow cannabis. I uh, grow bugs to kill bad bugs on your cannabis farm. So, uh, in conventional nice. agriculture, uh, one big thing that happens is a globalization of pests. Uh, Asian citrus psyllid on citrus right now. We have lantern flies eating up entire vineyards over on the East Coast. So at what point is uh, pest resistance going to become more than a novelty and uh, creating cultivars of uh, cannabis? And also, on top of that, what's the most susceptible strain that you've ever grown? Like, what's the Drosophila that we can test things on. <clears throat> so, well, go ahead. You got it. You got it straight. <laughs> so, so we're, so we're working on PM first, right? So we've we've collected a, a bunch of incredibly susceptible varieties, and a cup and a, a bunch of varieties that have really high resistance. We've sequenced the DNA of, of PM varieties from around the country, so that we know when we're looking at PM which strain of PM. It is because there's a bunch of different ones. Mm -hmm. We built a detached leaf assay, so instead of running a breeding program for PM in a in a building that you have to saturate and mold, we can we can run it in a clean building and pull off a leaf and take it into the lab, 
and inoculate it with a known quantity of PM and then quantitatively assess resistance. So we're on it. We're on it. But it will take a little while, and then we've got to do botrytis, and then we've got to do fusarium. So, like, we just didn't have a way to do this stuff scientifically before, but um, now we can do it. And then once you have a genetic marker for PM resistance, you can put that on all the backgrounds you want. So, so I, I two parts. One is I'll give you, I got a question for you. Um, because we just had this, Crystal Ortiz and I just had this conversation. She had a, uh, she had a, a root aphid, no, I think it was a, uh, it might have been a russet mite that they got onto her plant. So she, she brought in predatory mites. She does dry farming, all organic, beyond organic, regenerative farm, beautiful, beautiful garden. She introduces a predator, she, predatory mite, right? Gets in, works, gets rid of the, you know, stabilizes the environment. Next year she does it as prevention, right? They're working really well. She said, at what point in time does the introduction of this predatory mite be, start to shift the natural environment of, of, my, of my entire garden? When does the predatory mite start to breed and then take over in, in, in the area? So I think it was like a question for you. is like, have you done research on how to stop? Because I know the pike minnow, when it was introduced into the eel, right, to kill, to, to kill mosquitoes, ended up eating all the salmon eggs. And so then they had this like huge were like no steelhead, because they had introduced the pike minnow to kill the to kill the um, you know to to kill the mosquito. So, question to you is what? How do you stop a predatory mite from from breeding to ravage a, a you know a garden cult floriculture? Or when we're working on the smaller scale, like uh, prey mantis, for example, there are barely any prey mantis species that are actually native to the United States. Everything that you see is a Chinese mantis. But on the smaller scale, everything is incredibly finicky. So if there's no food there, the mite's not going to exist. The same thing with uh, parasitic wasps. Mm -hmm. And parasitic wasps are one of the greatest biocontrols out there because yeah. without the pest, there's no <coughs> parasite. So, so they Absolutely. kill the pest, and then they die because they die. their food is gone. Yeah, that's why you have to re-inoculate every year. Like, if you're using Oxidentalis, you're using Persimilis. Like, Persimilis doesn't even survive year to year half the time just because at some point the, uh, the spider mites will go into diapause, and then once they're in diapause, they're in the soil, and one's going to the soil, the other one's going to, right to the top of the plant. Yep. Yeah, so, so if you pre-inoculate, that might not, not even work because there, if there's no food there, they'll just die right away and they won't be there when the mites do show up. Is, is that true? That is true. And there are solutions to this. Providing enough food for them. You can provide pollen for certain species. They'll feed off the pollen until there's a better food source out there. Or you can really just introduce a mite that actually doesn't really do anything to your crop, it's just kind of there generally. So sacrificial it, source. Yeah, it's kind of like really. Yeah. Yeah. You're giving a, a dog some food in a bowl, yeah. and the food isn't gonna get up and crawl away and start eating all everything around yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. the uh, we gotta wrap it up on that because uh, there is a evidently a line of people upstairs waiting to get down here to listen to DJ Who. It's a, it's a whole band night, um, but there'll be live music, and I, I think I guess are free to stay if they want. Yeah, to. but there there's some reggae meets punk meets. Oh, there'll be some reggae. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy from Dub Club, Boss Harmonies. Yeah. All right. So we call we'll, him we'll, DJ we'll consider, This is like the the like end of episode one, and will to be continued on pest management. But I appreciate everybody coming. Hope you learned a lot. Uh, round of applause for our panelist, the marathon panel. <laughs> you, you made it the whole time. All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>